Hi, Hi Lucas. Hi. This, this is Drizzle. This is oh. me. I'm 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 Bill. I'm Will. Uh, as they say. Is that a dog or is that a a, a muff? Uh, uh that's a dead a muff. rat. That's the I dead got a zoom rat, H6. Okay. Oh fuck yeah, the H6 baby. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. <laughs> got the, the H1. <laughs> I got that. I got that H one, baby. Drizzle, if you don't know, do you know what the H one is, Drizzle? No. The dri- the Drizzle. Uh, the so he has like an actual audio recording device. Uh, yeah. Mine is the equivalent of this eraser compared uh-huh. to that. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's I'm, made of plastic. <laughs> I'm using my lovely PS four <laughs> uh, headset. Uh, I mean. That is now six, seven years old, so. I didn't know there was a PS4. <laughs> Not really into the video games. It's more my brother's speed. Anyway, uh, Lucas, um, I know we talked in email and stuff. Um, I'm off my meds, so, you know, I might be a little weird tonight. Okay. Don't, don't worry about it. That's why Chisel's here. He's here to, for protection. Okay. <laughs> um, pretty much. Is, is there anything that you don't want to talk about, or you want us to avoid? Uh, you know, it's uh, I don't think so. You know, you asked me that, and I'm like, well, what did you find? <laughs> no, no, no. I don't. I have no gotcha moments whatsoever. Sure. Um, I, like that's that's more Ken's thing because he's he's more of like he's an actual journalist. Uh, <laughs> I'm just I'm just a person. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah okay well good um yeah we can actually start whenever any questions that you have uh yeah i mean um do you know do you know who your regular or ideal audience is and what they might kind of be looking for as far as a quick win uh no <laughs> i mean pretty much the people that 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 listen to us uh they're in the tabletop games but the thing is, we have a pretty eclectic um, guest roster. We've had a lot of different people. Like, so it'll be game stuff, but I'll, we talk a lot about films as well. And oh, yeah. the idea is, so geeky gamer podcast. The the idea is is it's two gamers who are talking to people about what they are geeky about. Got so it. So it's not necessarily uh, into tabletop stuff because you know. Either there's not enough people, uh, or everyone's saying the fuck same fucking thing. So, <laughs> you know, we we kind of talk. We 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 dip into uh, politics and banter and all kinds of shit. Um, and I would like to promote, you know, your stuff. Uh, you sent me your website, the and I've got I've got pretty much that. Yeah, uh, uh, the Centella Centella dot studio, I think. Yeah, that's me. Um, yeah. That's kind of my working portfolio. Yeah. Uh, and at the moment, it's uh, making a monster. My podcast has been on hiatus for closing in on an embarrassing year now. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, that's that's the uh, thing that I promote. I was, he fucking does this whole thing. Yeah. No, it's I I I am still pretending that I'm going to get back to it. And I think I think over the summer there will be you know I'll be clearing out my backlog and deciding what's next for that project. But the bigger well, good, things you can... are hmm? go on, go on. Yeah, the bigger things for me are Book of Extinction and Precious Things. Okay, we'll say no more because we'll talk about it. Okay. <laughs> literally, we'll find out. Um, I'm going to attempt to stream right now. Okay. And uh, we'll see if it's a colossal fucking failure, in which case we're just going to use your guys' recordings. All right. Um, mm. All right, let's see if this is actually working. Blah, blah, blah. You guys talk amongst yourselves. I'm watching to see when it goes. Uh, yeah, sure I haven't. I haven't off. even. I haven't even attempted yet. Looks like it's choppy as shit. But you know what? We'll just see what happens. Are you sure you want to stream? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm gonna <laughs> Kind of don't want to do it. <laughs> Oh God! Um, oh, Cam was supposed to come show me how to do all that, but he's never, never done that. 
Um, no. Apparently, we are streaming, but, you know, of course, the audio is fucked up. <laughs> okay, hold on. There's literally every single time uh, I stream on here. Every time, every time I'm the person who's supposed to stream. Every time. Mm -mm -mm. We'll say window capture. Excuse me. We'll call it Discord. This was all set up. It's just my computer decided to uh, turn it off and not work anymore. Yeah, no worries. <sighs> blah, blah, blah. Holy shit. Who's that? Diet Uranium. Oh, oh it's Hulker. Hulker. It's Hulker. Hulker has arrived. As opposed to the better kinds of uranium. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hulker's a man. <laughs> Let's see if I can make this work. Uh, Hey, Drizzle, does it look like yes. we're actually on? Uh, it's, it's not showing up. That's good. Um, I'm glad about that. That's excellent. Okay. What we'll do is this. Um, and we are recording, right? Lucas, you're recording your end. I am. Yeah. Okay. And Ken is supposedly recording his, so I will get the stream up and when it goes up, then it'll be great between now and then. Oh, he's, uh, I, I killed him. Um, <laughs> he's, he's no more. Put him in my fridge and I ate him. No one's laughing. I, you yeah. guys, you guys introduce yourselves. Meanwhile, I'm gonna make OBS work. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Drizzle. Uh, been playing, uh, D and D and Dreadlord now for three, four years. Uh, but I only ever really played one serious campaign that then turned into another. Like, it's the same group of people. Um, played a couple of small campaigns, but never for the longevity of of anything. It's just been the one really long game with the same group type sort of stuff. Um, I also am a general manager at a haunted house. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Hulker, go ahead, and then we'll introduce the guest. My name is Daniel Holker. I have played in role-playing games off and on uh, since the mid-90s. Uh, I play in the uh, campaigns that our other uh, hosts are running or, or and playing in. And uh, I'm just so excited to be here. <laughs> and Lucas, our guest this evening, if you want to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Lucas Zellers. Uh, I started playing Dungeons and Dragons in 2015. I started writing for the game in 2018 and it became uh, my career circa 2021. Um, and I uh, did my first Kickstarter in 2023. So every couple of years I leveled up. Uh, you might know me from a, a project called Book of Extinction. You might know me from a podcast called Making a Monster. And I hope you will know me from a, a new project called Precious Things. Um, but yeah, I've been uh, I've been in the TTRPG space as uh, as a career for about six years now, depending on how you count it. Um, and it has been it's been a, it's been a trip. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and we've got Bill Bunkum over. I don't know if he's this way or this way or this way or this way. Yeah, but he is, uh, he is working on fixing our OBS system right now. So it'll he'll talk here in a few minutes. OK, I think what we're going to do is just record. Yep. Yeah, okay, we're just we going to record. Loading. We're just going to record um, and fuck live streaming. How's that sound? Yep. Because that way, uh, I don't lose my mind. Okay! Be comfy, be comfy. Uh, that means I don't have to watch chat, is what that means. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. You know, pre-recording is, is really the way to go in these things. Lucas, you have done 
a lot of podcasting. <laughs> um, tell me, tell, tell everyone what. Tell us about the podcasting. <laughs> it's an open-ended question. It's a good sure, SAT yeah. question. Tell us <laughs> about your your podcasting, please. Well, I did pretty well in the SAT. Uh, <laughs> not to out myself. Uh, how you, how how would you do? Uh, gosh, I don't remember. You're um, gonna date yourself with your score. Because I think they, I think they changed the the way they score it. They must have. I may have only taken the ACT. I don't I don't know. What was your score? I guarantee mine's lower than yours. One hundred percent. I'm an imbecile. Uh, up to 36. Yeah, that's the ACT. Then that I did fairly well. Uh, yeah, I got 35. <laughs> no, I don't know a single person that got a 35. I know people that got 36s and like 30s and stuff. Wow. My first yeah, time. Holker, Holker got a 20. I got a 23 both times. I mean, it, uh, not that, yeah, not no, that. no, no. It's a piece of shit score. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> Ogre was like yeah, a good of 20. That's <laughs> like, right. I then started, what'd you um, I, I, I had been looking at podcasting in about 2014 when it was, mm. when it would have been smart to start. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, it took me until 2020 to really get it going. Uh, Cause it took me that long to um, have the equipment and a question yeah. that I really wanted an answer to. Mm. And suddenly I had a whole lot of time uh, for reasons yeah. I'm sure you'll remember. Um, so what? I, I, <laughs> uh, you know, a <clears throat> massive unprecedented public health crisis happened, and we all got a hobby, and it was either that or, or baking bread. And uh, <laughs> I already knew how to bake bread. Yeah. Um, but Bread's yeah, awesome. I had been, like I said, I've been publishing for Dungeons and Dragons on uh, a website called the DMs Guild. Uh, it started in 2018, um, mm. back when back when that was, I think, a, back when that was still a relatively unknown path to to publishing. So it's meeting all these people and being a part of all the, these collaborative projects where people were really uh, getting their hands on old stories and ways of telling them. And it was really interesting to me the way they handled some of these stories, because I never mm. uh, you never see a monster without seeing the culture that it came from. And for 50 years, Dungeons and Dragons has been begging, borrowing and outright stealing from every culture and mythos and religion on the planet. Sure. Uh, so part of that, the the main question was, okay, let me just trace the lines from mm. where this monster ended up now uh, to where it began. So we start with a reference point of a game designer and a monster that they have made. It was important mm. to me to find someone who had to put a numerical value on something like a werewolf or a mummy. Uh, and from there, we got to look straight backward through time along that line to see uh, especially in the context of TTRPGs, where had this thing been portrayed before and how had that portrayal differed and changed over time? Uh, and it became a really fascinating question. I thought it was just going to be, hey, dragons are kind of cool. Let's talk about that. <clears throat> and it turned into this fascinating conversation about otherness and uh, monstrosity and the way we treat those who are different than us. Um, mm. so I'm still having that conversation today, even though I haven't put out an episode in a hot minute. Uh, mm. and I still plan to continue having that conversation because I think it's really, really important. Um, the main thing I got out of the podcast was a huge network of other game designers, uh, who were really, really good and really intentional about the way that they approached the craft. Um, so that's, that's making a monster in a nutshell. It's that conversation about 60 times. Uh, with a couple of variations and a couple of spins on it in between. That's a, it's a good poignant, um, what's the word? It's not a thesis. It's like the start of a thesis. Abstract. Did you, yeah. Did you do the good in school? <laughs> I did okay. <laughs> Sounds like you did good in school. I good. did well. And not uh, yeah. no good. <laughs> So did, um, the, yeah, so did the podcast help you in your publishing? Oh, absolutely. Um, part of it was uh, when I had an idea that I wanted to pursue for publishing, I had a whole bunch of people I could ask about it, um, up to and including the person who en ended up becoming the publisher for my book. Um, uh, well, bo both of the books, actually. Uh, and 
not only that, it gave me a huge group of people to sort of serve as beta readers, uh, people who could be a great resource for the podcast or for the for the book in general, people who knew stuff about the thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a logical progression from the Well, I, maybe not a logical progression because the whole thing still feels kind of unreal. Uh, but it was the hill down which I gradually rolled and found myself an author at the bottom. <laughs> That's um, a good bottom to fall into. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so tell us about your book, and what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> just plug it all. I'm going to ask all the questions. You know what I'm going to ask? Just answer the question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and it is like I don't, I don't like to. It, it, it is a plug, sure, but it's also like you, you kind of have to understand this to know. Like this, this project came out of of my attitude as a game designer. Like mm. one of the main things I learned from making a monster was that a monster does not exist separate from the culture that created it. Um, everywhere you go in the world, there's some version of a zombie and some version of a vampire. And they all reflect uh, the the worries and anxieties of the people who, who told sure. that story and the, the climate in which they told them. <clears throat> and that, uh, if you if you look at a monster and see a culture, then you look at an animal or a species or a plant and you see an ecosystem or a habitat. Um, you kind of see the world in exactly the same way. Uh, so I wanted to, I wanted, to, I'd been doing short adventures, small projects, and I really wanted something meaty, something to kind of stake my claim on and kind of take that next step in the industry. So I settled on a monster manual of extinct species. So we took real life and extinct animals, most of whom had gone uh, extinct in the modern era, circa 1500 AD and forward. Um, and then remythologized them into Dungeons and Dragons monsters. We ran them through that same process of becoming a monster that uh, I had learned through the podcast, only we did it really, really fast. Mm. Uh, and we told 70 plus uh, real life extinction stories and found some really heartbreaking things about the way we have treated the natural world as as a society and culture and species over the last few hundred years um and some really interesting things about the way that we tell stories and the way we we remember that process and i hope uh some really fascinating things to play at your table some monsters that are fit and ready for the the hyper magical fantastic world of dungeons and dragons jesus christ uh, that's high-minded <laughs> I, this is this is this is I I, I am in the perfect yeah <laughs> I'm in the perfect mood for this. <laughs> uh, uh, so 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 Hulker is is a bit of a historian. Uh, I'm sure he's got questions about. Oh yeah. Uh, your your extinct species. Yeah. I. Okay. Uh, so you said you only concentrated on animals that have been that went extinct from the 1500s on. To the present? Yeah, the wa well, the watchword for the book was anthropogenic extinctions, uh, which ended up including large mammals from the last ice age, depending oh, no. on how you count it and who you ask. <laughs> uh, I mean, it really helped us out to be able to put a giant saber-toothed tiger in the book. Um, really helped Humans did it. On what we were doing. Uh, but yeah, most of what we worked with was uh, post-industrial extinctions. Part of Partly because that is uh, when we had record of them. Um, mm. You know, that was uh, the age of sale was when we started getting written accounts of a lot of places that had never been uh, written about before, like Tasmania. And mm. partly because that was around the time when species started going extinct at an alarmingly precipitous rate, like really, really quickly uh, in ways that they never had before. Uh, do you ever have so you went through a process of turning them into monsters that could then be incorporated into D&D's mythology yeah. uh, what if those monsters just went extinct like in D&D &D? <laughs> like they rolled a one you know sometimes <laughs> it happens we did talk about that they uh, all rolled the... ones one of the fun things that we got to do with the book was add a chapter about monster extinctions. So we, we learned the mechanisms by which creatures go extinct. There are five of them, generally. Mm. Uh, climate change, habitat loss, invasive species, population growth, and overutilization. 
Um, so if we imagine, what about? I mean, what about DM inconvenience? Right, <laughs> DM just looks at it and says, "Ah, you know, I can't work this into the story." Oh, uh, yeah, it's like you were never there. You know, it was uh, God. <laughs> yeah, that I mean, the that's that's a magical sort of outside force, and it, you know, we did consider it. Uh, there's a parallel to that in in the way that we thought about extinction and the balance of nature. Uh, but yeah, it's you know, we we wanted to give DMs tools a greater de biodiversity of monsters to work with and finding one that would like work for what they're doing or, or that was that was more convenient or, or more interesting was the watchword for the fiction half of the book. What's a what, what's what's an example or a couple examples of of these extinct species? Yeah, so there are a couple of ways that we did it by and large. For some of these creatures, they were monsters already. Um, those those ice age megafauna that I mentioned, like a saber tooth tiger, that was in D. That's uh, saber tooth cat. Started. Mm -hmm. Sorry to correct you, but ti saber tooth tigers don't exist. They're saber tooth cats. <laughs> yeah, there's no reason to believe it had stripes, and no reason it, to believe it was related. No, it might have had stripes, but it still would be a tiger. Uh, you know, we uh, common names are an absolute mess, and we had to deal with nomenclature an awful lot. Uh, so those just went straight in the book. Uh, we didn't have to change them because they're already monsters. Some came into the book with legends of their own. Uh, for example, we looked at the Japanese wolf. Um, Japan had its own native wolf for a while, uh, hmm. and they had stories about it. They called it Okuri Okami, the wolf that guards the way. Um, hmm. So for that one and for a couple others, we just got to retell that story as faithfully as we could in the in using D&D &D mechanics. Um, and we did that a few times. For some of them, we were inspired by the legacies that they had left behind. Uh, when we looked at, um, oh gosh. Uh, for some of them, we looked at uh, existing D&D mechanics. So there was a, a frog in northwestern or northeastern Australia um, that incubated its young in its own stomach so it was a frog with a frog inside it i think i've heard like, of that yeah the gastric breathing I think I've heard frog of that. um rio Batrachus silas and it I, I looked i took one look at that and went that's a frog of holding i know exactly what that <laughs> is, how it works uh, so D &D told me what it was and that's how we got to do it and then for some of them we just cut them out a whole cloth uh, there, you know, there wasn't, some of them went extinct too quickly after they had been discovered to leave any kind of imprint on our collective memory or our storytelling and oral tradition. Um, in Maine and the, the northeastern coast of the U.S., there was a, a mink that lived in the, that lived on, on tidal coastal areas, uh, along tidal areas and tidal caves, and was about twice the size of inland wood minks. Uh, and we we only it was only described to science after it went extinct and we were pretty much sure from the records that we have that it went extinct due to unregulated fur trade um so that one became uh, a vengeful zombie riding out, rising out of a shell midden to take back the skin that had been taken from it jesus um, christ i mean That's it cool. was it was one of the most brutal things we put in the book and it's <laughs> it just like it was the logical next step so that was kind of the process. Some of them were monsters already. Some of them had monsters attached to them. Some of them were echoed in existing D and D mechanics, and some of them we just got to we just got to tell the stories that we wanted to that were suggested by the reading that we had done. And that process we did that seventy some times, and it was fascinating and heartbreaking every time. Now, who is we? Uh, me and the team at Mage Hand Press. So one of the people I met when I was doing the podcast was Mike Hollick. Uh, he had started a blog called Middle Finger of Vecna to update a lot of old uh, third and three point <laughs> five edition stuff to five. <laughs> You're laughing because I feel like you might know his words. <laughs> no, I'm laughing because it's the middle finger of Vecna. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. Um, yeah, so that became Mage Hand Press in about 2016 when they launched Dark Matter which is a sci-fi <clears throat> conversion for fifth edition. Um, so I called up Mike. I said, hey, I'm, I'm going to do this Kickstarter later this year. Uh, 
can you give me some advice? He, he's, he's, and he still does this for people. He'll give you, he'll talk about Kickstarters that he's run and how you might do yours better. Oh, I heard, I heard some of, uh, I'm pretty, I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Pretty sure I listened to a little bit of this dude. Uh, oh, great. As in on your, on your uh, podcast, but continue, please. Yeah, he's, he's good on air. He knows his stuff. Um, his advice to me when I brought him this idea was not to do it. Uh, <laughs> It's like, don't books, fucking it do turns that, out, are extremely expensive. They're very art heavy. And I just, he knew that this was a good idea and I didn't have the resources to do it on my own. He said, do it with me. I'm, I'm going to, we're going to put this project together. Um, so we worked out a collaboration agreement and uh, we, we went forward with it. It was published under the Mage Hand label. And uh, mm. yeah, we're, we're still working together uh, two, three years later now at this point. That's really cool. I <laughs> I know what you mean. Um, <laughs> right. So you uh, you made this book. Uh, what what are the dimensions of the book and all that good stuff? Oh, it's meant to fit on the shelf with uh, with all the other sort of D and D. Do books. you have a copy of it? I don't. We are just in the process of getting it printed. Uh, we did the Man. final editing pass this week. Um, not to date the video or whatever. It's probably going to get to people and, and shipping and printing is like a whole thing that I also wasn't ready for that I'm really glad Mike brought me on for so we're expecting yeah, it'll be in people's bitch. hands yeah we're expecting it'll be in people's hands probably early next year we're hoping by uh, PAX but uh, PAX Unplugged is but, in December but I doubt it Oh, okay. I don't know I don't know what PAX Unplugged is oh it's a tabletop convention in Philadelphia oh okay uh, is it P-A-C-T uh, or P-A-X? Uh, PAX Unplugged. So Penny Arcade Expo is a, yeah. a video gaming convention that started a while, and then the tabletop world has gotten big enough and powerful enough to kind of split off and justify its own little get-together of nerds. That's, that's pretty sweet. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, Um, I was thinking like PAX Romana or whatever. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, which I wouldn't be surprised if gamers and and tech people have the same kind of sense of humor, which is to say oh, yeah. none. We're thinking about the Roman <laughs> Empire all the time. Of course. Um, Lord Almighty, there's a lot to cover. Uh, <laughs> so what are the dimensions of the book? Uh, offhand? Hmm. Well... Let me get the... Can you give me an idea of uh... fluid and units of player manuals? <laughs> <laughs> or show us in the area of eight and a half by eleven. I think that's what I'm looking at. If it's a D and D book, it's about eight and a half by eleven. Yeah, it's going to be the full size. It's going to yeah. sit right on your shelf with one of these. Yeah. So it's almost one player handbook. <laughs> <laughs> Like point um, eight about, player handbooks. About how many pages? Uh, two sixty. Oh, like so that. it's it's kind of beefy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot in it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the the book that I wrote, um, it's a tabletop role playing game, and um, I did I opted for the executive, uh, size, which is a ten by seven, because I, I just. Oh, yeah. Do you remember? Do you remember the old uh, second ed? Um, they were supplement materials, and what were they called? Something Arcana, not Unearthed Arcana. It was before that shit. Um, <laughs> I think it was something Arcana. Uh, anyway, it, there were three of them, and they were like faux leather bound, oh. and they had the they had the old uh, dragon like uh, TSR, I think, mm -hmm. maybe. Anyway, a logo. Do you know what I'm talking about? barely uh i've i've gone through a lot of older source books trying to get uh get, doing it's, research for the book it's but. wild it's, it's called like magica incarnum or something uh it's kind of a what's the word i'm looking for not standard and not tropey just sort of a latiny we'll just call it cliche tropey name yeah yeah, yeah. but they're, they're these cool fucking books it's like they're just reference they have um it's all black and white, um, almost like block print art. And it's just magic items or 
<clears throat> monsters or whatever. It's really interesting shit. Oh, and they yeah. were they were that size, like like manuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I made as I I'm not. This is a shameless plug. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's it's this thing. Thing is, ten by seven. So this is around, um, I want to say it's like 100,000 words. That D&D &D book, that PHB has around 300,000 words. So the idea being that extra space. Oh, there's a fucking book. It's upside down, Hulker. Uh, <laughs> that extra space, <laughs> as in the 10 by 7, 8 and a half by 11, seriously, dramatically reduces like by about a hundred pages. Oh yeah. Um, so this is around five hundred pages, and it's literally the entire fucking book, and loads of lore and all kinds of shit. But when people see this, they're like, what? Yeah. you know, because you can kill a motherfucker <laughs> with it. It looks um, like it looks like you could kill a guy with it. It's 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 a whole. You can sit that right on your coffee table. It's serious. <laughs> um, and I sat there thinking, you know, I I think I get why D and D. Or Wizard of the Coast, or who the fuck owns it now? Um, is it still Watsy, or is it just That's Hasbro? Moment, yeah. yeah. Anyway, that okay. size is really nice. It's just it's. I wanted it to be not the standard size, you know. So it wasn't yeah, just feel different. So there what is... what what possessed you guys to? I guess D and D is kind of your jam. So yeah, part of it was we. Our promise with the book was to give conservation advocates and educators a new language for talking about extinction and a way to connect with people in a richer and stronger way than um, than they had before. And mm. that meant we had to borrow both the conventions and wisdom of conservation advocates and scientists and kind of the set dressing of Dungeons and Dragons so that it would oh. feel like you were able to access both. Um, Which is a marketing thing. Well, mm, Yes and no. Uh, I mean, yeah. is what you said true, or is it? Does it just? Is it bullshit? <laughs> Did you just say bullshit, or is that actually what you tried to do? No, no. I mean, it's we. Yes, it was a marketing move because we're publishing okay. under, uh, under that license, and yes, yeah. it it helped us to be able to work in a system with which people were familiar. But also, it was a it was a very calculated move to choose. Uh, D and D and fifth edition specifically for mm. this project. Um, 5e oh, yeah. made Dungeons and Dragons more accessible than it has ever been, and Dungeons and Dragons is kind of the exemplar of heroic fantasy. Was really tied mm. into a lot of the stuff that we were talking about. This era of the gentleman explorer and going into a place right. that was just fine before you got there and extracting the valuable piece of it and bringing it home and turning that into experience points. Like the tension between those two things was a part of the artistic statement that we were making. Um, mm. So yes and yes. Uh, I think both things are true in this in this case. Well, so it, issue. it, makes, a, it makes a lot of sense that to use it as D&D &D because how many D&D &D players just go in and decimate a town or, you know, like literally walk in and stab everything and take stuff out. That that makes sense that it would be a very good field to put extinction information into. Sounds um, like there's no errata for this. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, we've worked but, pretty hard to get the, ad, the, to get the typos out of it. I've got, I've got, I've got, now three things. One, you will never get the typos out. Two, yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> it will never happen. Uh, two, you mentioned that something along the lines of this. This is really my question. What, what, what were you actually saying? Is it a five hundred one c or something? Like, what do you? What do you? Are you attached to a preservation type entity? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so. For a long, a, a big part of the run-up to the project, we uh, we released a preview as kind of a pay-what-you-want thing. And everything we earned from the preview went to support the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, at the, you know, we're still, uh, the book is still being sold under the Mage Hand Press label, and we're, we're looking for ways to continue to, it's, you know, it, it has the same business model as any other publisher. We're still looking for ways to, to work with organizations like the Center and support conservation efforts. We're gonna have to get creative now that we're out of the the fundraising and awareness. Oh, the Kickstarter, right? The um, 
um, yeah. for the Kickstarter. I will say that uh, the Center for Biological Diversity in particular has been a really strong partner in this project since the beginning. When I had the idea, I knew that it was going to require some, uh, some scientific knowledge that I didn't have and a certain amount of legitimacy that I couldn't bring to bear to the project mm. as, a, as a writer and an educator. Um, so I called around to a lot of different uh, conservation organizations and the center for the, most of them didn't quite get it. And to be fair, it's a hard pitch uh, if you're not coming to it from the world of if you don't already know what TTRPGs are and what they're capable right. of doing for people. Um, the Center for Biological Diversity was one of the first people I called that locked in on what this could do and what this could be. And they locked in hard. Um, they saw this as a really strong way of showing new people, uh, introducing them to the issues that are that are still at play and still driving species extinct. Um, and they, they recognized the, the theater of it and the potential that that had for bringing people's uh, emotions to bear and connecting them to nature in a way that other avenues can't. Uh, so they they helped us a lot. They uh, helped us promote the project. They uh, gave us access to a science consultant who went over every factual entry we put in the book and made sure I had my head on straight. Brought a lot of research experience and hands-on um, advocacy and uh, uh, field work experience to the book. Interesting. Um, did you have to? Did you have to pay him? <laughs> that was part that's of a lot part. of man that's, that's a lot of man hours they, yeah they they invested pretty strongly in making sure that this happened um and it was uh you know we we didn't ask for anything that they weren't able to do it was a really um sophisticated working relationship with our science consultants uh you know we knew what she was capable of and um she really loved it uh her name is tiara curry by the way and she's on there's a couple episodes with her on making a monster if you want to meet Say it her. again uh, her name is Tierra Curry, and there's a Tierra of... Curry, mm -hmm. Curry like like Curry. Yeah, and Tierra, and Tierra. Like Tierra. right on. Yeah, right on. Yeah, she's incredible. Um, absolute powerhouse of a woman and a science advocate. <clears throat> um, and uh, yeah, she really helped whip the book into shape. Uh, mm. Gave me access to a lot of information that I might not have known to look for. I am otherwise. insanely jealous of this team <laughs> that you you had going on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm insanely jealous of this. This yeah, is great. We, we shot for the moon, and and some people really, we some people really got it and and gathered around the project really, really. Well, just having a partner um, that actually like you know, you know, doesn't suck, uh, <laughs> and and fucking bitch out on everything, and uh, you know, then blame you. For example, that's 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 pretty good, right there. Yeah. So, so how'd you yeah. manage that? <laughs> uh, I got really good at cold calling people. Uh, yeah, no, I mean like uh, your your actual partner in this in this uh, thing. Oh yeah, uh, and actually, so the is it one person? How big's your team? I'm I'm gonna shut up and answer. Yeah. I'll allow you to answer the question. Sorry. So Mage Hand Press is about three people, uh, and then a network of freelancers. And most publishers in the TTRPG space have that same kind of structure, just with bigger or smaller core teams. Uh, so yeah, a multi. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of really successful people run with just one and just like some some people that they managed to work with. And a lot of the people who ended up on making a monster were just in that like cadre of freelancers that were working for, you know, hit points or DMs Guild or whoever. You know, working for hit points. I like that. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> so working for hit points. I will work for hit points. Uh, working for in-game blowjobs. I get it. It's fine. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I... Uh, uh, so that's the Mage Hand Press team, and then the artists that they. And you own that company? No, no. I Mike Mike owns that company. And Mike I, does. I, okay. Um, Mage Hand Press. What a douche! Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it. I love it. Nero was pretty cool because I uh, she she has been a part of uh, litigating for protection under the Endangered Species Act for a long time, like mm. a long time. And her name was still on a press release with regard to the Florida fairy shrimp from circa 2011 or 2014, I think. Yeah, I think um, I read I that one. I called her. Her her name and number was on it. Oh. I, was, I just called her. Because <laughs> uh, I wanted, the, like, there was some information missing from the press release. I wanted the whole mm. story. I kind of wanted to see, sure. you know, I was doing what a journalist would do. And uh, she picked up. Mm. Um, when you have a project, like... 
This project was high-minded enough that people found a reason to believe in, to believe in it. Um, I had a really straightforward way that she could help, and I had a really straightforward way that the project could help her and the center. Um, and we. What were you know, those worked, things? Yeah, and that was how we put. That was the story, and I did this with a lot of people. Um, I called a couple museums uh, to to try and talk to them about their advocacy work or specific species that they had worked with in the past. Uh, and it was, you know, it was a it was a really great kind of hand hand in glove way of working together. So okay, when you so, were going, sorry. Uh, yeah, when you were um, when you were trying to get all this together, uh, did you roll for initiative? No, not at all. <laughs> Nothing I did could. He doesn't quit. He doesn't go of, of rolling initiative. Um, I... <laughs> how did? Okay, I've got a couple questions. One. Um, so how did, how did this, this person or a person benefit? And then, cause you, you said you contacted them and you had a very clear goals, right? right? Yeah. I'm not looking for doxing people. I'm looking for just <laughs> in general information, like you, for other people that are attempting to get a team yeah. and, 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 you know, attaches and shit, being very clear about your goals is, is important. So mm -hmm. What? <laughs> Tell us what? What is it? What do you mean? Yeah. So, like, hey, well, this would help you. Ha! No. Yeah. You had like an actual goal. What was it? Yeah. Um, I. It's it's so simple that it's it's incredibly difficult. Uh, there were basically three things that I told everybody. Hey, this is who I am. Um, mm. I have this kind of background, and I can really pull this off. Uh, you know, I gave him my bond mots as a publisher and, uh, working with Mei Chan gave me a lot of legitimacy in that way to say, we really can put together a 260 page hardcover and get it in people's hands. Um, and then I would say, you know, this is what I'm looking for. I, I see that you, uh, for example, I see that you, uh, were involved in the campaign to find and protect the Florida fairy shrimp. I want to know more about that. Uh, can you get on a call and you know can i do an interview and we'll publish it on the episode and we'll get more attention and then you know there's for everybody this part is different you kind of want to find the the way that what you're doing can help them as well uh and in the case of the center for biological diversity a lot of what they do is public adv advocacy both in right. the legal realm and in the media and uh you know performance art realm so for me to say we have this kind of new artistic take on this and a new way of bringing attention to this that's what they do mm -hmm. uh, and i had a way of helping them accomplish their goals and they had a way to take that momentum that i could build and then use it towards their goals like not every conservation organization can work with that kind of support um, right they could so uh every cold email that i every every person i approached to be a part of this project at whatever level uh I had I made sure I had those three things in a row before I got on the before I got on the horn was to let them know what I was trying to do, how I knew I could do it, um, what I wanted from them that was specific and easy for them to accomplish, and then very specifically <laughs> what they were how they would see benefit either towards them directly or for things that they valued uh, mm. for being a part of uh, what I was asking them to do with me. Yeah. It sounds like it sounds like this has nothing to do with D and D. It it really doesn't. I mean, a lot of that kind of way of networking and building a team that applies everywhere. Um, like I said, I think there's something inherently D and D uh, about this project. Like I think Dungeons and Dragons makes this an interesting question and adds something that's artistically valuable, but. Um, this is good advice and good practice for anyone who wants to, to put together a team for whatever you're doing. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, maybe you've answered this. Perhaps it's implicit. Um, are you an activist? <laughs> I am now. Uh, but I you weren't before this project. No, partly because I didn't understand the gravity of the situation. Uh, I knew there were a lot of extinct animals. I did not know that we are living through what some people call uh, the sixth mass extinction of life on Earth, uh, an extinction event the likes of which has only ever happened five times in the planet's history. Uh, I didn't know that the reasons that it is happening are largely 
anthropogenic, that is human caused or, or the direct result of decisions that we make, some of which are just the result of casual inertia or lack of attention to things that I think were really important. And weirdly, mm. by the end of this project, I'm, I've, I've written some of the most complete uh, records of some of these species that exist. Like, no one's paying a lot of attention to a tiny brine shrimp that lived in a very particular pool in Gainesville, Florida. But that was the Florida fairy shrimp. And I think that story is, uh, that story is important. It's typical of what, of what happens over and over again. It doesn't get a lot of attention. So I became an advocate over the course of it. And uh, honestly, it was a two-year masterclass, a two-year crash course in, uh, uh, in conservation advocacy. I'd put it on par with, uh, I'd put it on par with anything I did in college, certainly. So. Um. So you're saying when you, you've written about these things, you're saying you've done the research and you're literally writing about these things and it's real information. And then at what point does the nonfiction become fiction in this book? Yeah. The trick of it is that they happen right next to each other, uh, back to back. So we'll tell you on one page the story of America's passenger pigeon. Um, you know, the most numerous bird that has maybe ever existed on this planet. And then on the immediate facing page, here's what that would be if you were playing in a Dungeons and Dragons game, if it existed in a world where magic was real. And, okay, so uh, there's a clear divide. It's not like, it's not an influence. It's a, hey, here's some real shit. If you want to use it in D&D, &D, here you go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and you can, the, the, the beauty of that is that you can kind of see how those stories become fantasy uh and mm. there's like direct you and I, I get the privilege of being very explicit about my influences there like yeah yeah exactly this is this is the monster that this would make because that's what actually happened mm. what were you saying uh hulker passenger pigeons uh this is this is relevant to us because of where we're, we're originally from. But I think the last passenger pigeon died in 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, the uh, the last one out of all of those countless billions that the, like the last one was in the Cincinnati Zoo. Yeah, that's correct. Her name was Martha. <laughs> Martha. I know. <laughs> Zach really took me a solid on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're not far from Cincinnati originally, so... Yeah, yeah, there's a weirdly high amount of America's natural history that happened in Ohio. Um, Cincinnati, The Cincinnati Zoo was home to not one, but at least two endlings. Uh, it was also the home of the last Carolina parakeet. Uh, really? Hmm? Incas and uh, prior to him, Lady Jane, they were a mated pair. Uh, and then... Um, the, uh, if you go to, if you're in the Cincinnati area, you should stop by Big Bone Lick State Park. Uh, it is where they dug up the mastodon teeth, like French fur traders dug up mastodon teeth in this, in, you know, along the Ohio river in the 1400s, brought it all the way, brought them all the way back to France, uh, and gave them to Georges Cuvier. Uh, uh, who worked with the entire scientific community at the time to try and figure out to which elephant these teeth belonged and were forced to come to the conclusion that whatever it was did not exist anymore. And that was circa 1796. And that was the beginning of the idea of extinction. That was the first time the scientific community admitted that there were that there were creatures on the planet that are now no longer. Uh, and which is bizarre because, you know, the first, almost one of the first things that kids grow up learning about nature is that there are no more dinosaurs anymore. Like it seems extremely obvious to us now, but there was a point less than, you know, less than 300 years ago where that simply w that wasn't considered possible. And all that started in Ohio. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, we're just Big Bone Lick's not that far from where we're at. Oh, it looks like Will dropped out, dropped out. He 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 went frozen there for just a second. Yeah, it was but, uh, yeah. 
so I uh, I want to ask you a few more questions, if, if you will. Yeah. What's the most recent animal that went extinct that made it into your book? Um, and what happened to it? The, I've got this in the table. I want to make sure I get it right. At this point, there are an awful lot of names and dates. We did yeah. cover the northern white rhinoceros, which is technically not extinct. Uh, there are two living individuals of that species currently, Najin and her daughter Fatu, and uh, uh, those are the last two of the species. Um, before that, it would have been Rabs's fringe-limbed tree frog, the last of which died at uh, the Atlanta, uh, the last of which died in Atlanta on September 28, 2016. Wow, that recent. Yeah. Huh. I I, I didn't. Know. I I thought. I mean, with frogs, you hear about all sorts of uh, tropical frogs going extinct. Uh, I keep hearing it being blamed on a fungus or or, or something that. Uh, and I hear this. I hear the same thing. A similar story with bats. Uh, being just devastated by by some sort of disease that's just going through through their population but i've never heard of i've heard of frogs uh around here succumbing to well extinction or for for whatever reason yeah uh so the the fungus you're thinking of is batrachochytrium dendrobatitis or bd uh, and it causes a disease called chytridiomycosis in frogs um it interrupts the their ability to absorb electrolytes through their skin and basically gives them a heart attack. And uh, this it has over a 90% mortality rate in the species that it infects. Um, and that has been going on since 2005, I think. Uh, maybe earlier. It's been really hard to pin down when that started. And it has the, it has the, the dubious honor of giving amphibians, making amphibians the most endangered class of animals on the planet. Um, thankfully, it hasn't gotten to America just yet, or, or rather it has, but um, we, uh, I'd, I'd have to check on that. I, I, I'm pretty sure BD has been detected on all seven continents at this point. Um, but uh, most of the, most of the frogs that it, in fact, that it affects have been um, further south of us. Rabs's fringe-limbed tree frog uh, was from Panama. But the last one died in Atlanta? Yeah. In 2005, uh, BD was detected in Panama, and a massive concerted effort was made to try to outrun that disease. So they just grabbed, they just, they, uh -huh. and it's, it, it is as reckless and crazy as it sounds. They just went to Panama and grabbed as many frogs as they could find and put them in these um, bio-isolated container units in places like Atlanta, uh, because they knew that if they did not, then they would never find or see these frogs again. And Rabs's fringe-limbed tree frog in, in particular hadn't been described to science before. Um, so yeah, it was native to Panama. The last one was, was pulled out um, and uh, you know, just ahead of this, uh, this you know, the most, the, the deadliest pathogen known to man. Are there, uh, did you ever try and cover any flora in your book or was it all ex uh, exclusively animals? It was exclusively animals. We, we touched on, we touched on plants, um, in a couple of ways, but, uh, our book admittedly suffers from, uh, the same problem that a lot of conservation had advocacy has in that we focus on charismatic vertebrates. Um, humans as a, as have a tendency to connect well with things that have a spine and a face, especially if they're big and fuzzy and cool. Uh, so a lot of the, the records of extinctions have tended to focus on that as well. Um, and it was just a better fit for what D&D is capable of doing. Uh, the smallest stat block in Dungeons & Dragons is a frog. If it's smaller than a frog, D and D just doesn't have the resolution to render it effectively. Um, so we knew that was going to be kind of a problem going in, but that was uh, one of the ways the system kind of demanded that we handle the handle the, the topic. Yeah, because you can still have to appeal to the <laughs> appeal to the masses, kind of. Well, 
appeal, yeah, but also we yeah. had to be we had to be faithful to what we were doing. Um, yeah, I mean, one hit point is kind of the the base unit of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, like I already said, Frog has one. Uh, so you know, um, if it couldn't be rendered with a stat block, then uh, it it wasn't a good candidate for this particular way of looking at it. Oh, I was I was meaning where you were talking about the the stuff with the spine and the face and the, yeah. and, and the cute. That's what I was. Yeah. I I I say that to sort of apologize. Well, I'm I'm not apologizing because I, I I know what we were doing, but to admit the limits of the project. Um, yeah. In an ideal world, we would treat uh, every lost species with equal gravity. Um, but in this particular artistic statement, in this you know, in this particular system the bias towards vertebrates, uh, especially charismatic ones, was kind of baked into what we were doing. Now, while you were uh, turning these animals into fictional creatures, uh, in the process, did you min-max their character sheets to show like how a DM could just be, like, be really horrible to their players and maybe just do a clean team kill that they're not expecting and end the campaign so, they, so the, the DM can just go home and not have to worry about these people every Tuesday night. <laughs> I mean, if you're looking for that kind of an out, then I think maybe you need to reconsider whether Dungeon <laughs> Master is the role for you. Huh. Uh, but I mean, we we tried really hard to make sure that these were table ready. And I think that's the other thing that Maychan Press brought. Like third party uh, companies like Maychan Press could gather this kind of this reputation for being sloppy or less than up to snuff. We were extremely rigorous with how we put these things together. They they are mechanically sound according to the rules of the game. Like we didn't sacrifice um, mechanical effectiveness just to make a point. It was it was important to us that they they worked on both levels. So if you want a a, a monster that's going to kill your entire party, there's one or two in here at least, um, uh, and it will be fair play. I think by the end of it, <laughs> which one? <laughs> you don't DM Hulker. That's <laughs> not yet. <laughs> There's a party killer in the. Let me look at my CR table. All I'm saying is, if I DM and something that just looks very suspiciously like a Megalania pops out, <laughs> just you know, just tear up your character sheet. <laughs> <laughs> we got Megalania in here. Um, Hell yeah! You better. Monitor uh, I read early on that there is a phase of an alligator's lifestyle where it is arboreal. Like young alligators can and will climb trees, and that was absolutely terrifying to me. Uh, so when we rendered our giant monitor lizard, I was like, "Put it in a tree," because that's the scariest thing I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> There were there were some there were some crocodile there, there there were crocodilians I don't think they were crocodiles or alligators or fit cleanly within any of those um, lineages that were a little more arboreal not arboreal but terrestrial mm. and and went extinct quite recently uh, many of them were were more than capable of galloping or even running at least short distances on land uh, they sounded really scary to me I don't know did they did they make make it into your book. We did consider the cursorial alligator. <laughs> the problem with that one was it was too uh, too far back. Um, so we, I had a hard cap at the uh, at the Pliocene. Uh, I didn't want to go further back than that because before that, uh, humans, as we understand them, weren't a part of the, you know weren't on the scene yet. So I think that one was a Miocene creature, uh, and it didn't make the cut for that reason alone. But I did consider it because like. Yeah, uh, give me an alligator, but crank the run speed up to 40 or 50 feet, and you've got something absolutely terrifying. Uh, uh, what about, and I look, I, 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 I'm just, just going to quiz you to see what animals are in there, because I'm, I'm a bit of a natural history nerd. Uh, my uh, favorite game to play with people. I found early on that people love, like, they're, like there's an animal that they love, and they wanted to see it in the book. So I, I love playing this game. Okay. Uh, round one. Uh, by lack of Leo Carnifex. Uh, the marsupial lion. Absolutely. Yeah. 
uh, the highest bite force per pound of body mass uh, that has yet been recorded on the planet. Um, that guy was for sure in the book. One for that thing always. For Hulker. <laughs> that, I'm, I'm, that thing always scared me because it it always uh, evolutionarily, I believe. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe maybe I, I misread it, but. Uh, its evolutionary history was uh, uh, from herbivores that just, you know, had a taste for meat uh, uh, at some point. And so they didn't have canines, so that's that's why their their teeth are in that kind of configuration. It, it always uh, it always strikes me as what would happen if, say, uh, in speculative evolution, if, if rodents ever became, uh, say, apex carnivores in their respective ecosystems, maybe sometime in the future. Yeah. Absolutely it scary. It's, it's weird. The closest living, and if uh, if you want to get a sense of what we're talking about, the closest living relative to uh, a marsupial lion is the Tasmanian devil. Uh, and that thing's a bone cracker on feet. And that's it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is this is not what you think of when you think of lion. It's weird and sideways to uh, to most of to most other mammals. What about uh, what about any of the ground sloths? Uh, we got one, um, partly for resolution. Uh, we did put in a giant ground sloth. Let me check which one. Uh, Megatherium americanum. Uh, and when we were, you know, we talked about resolution and uh, the difference between a, a couple of different species of ground sloth wasn't going to be enough to justify giving it a whole different stat block. Uh, so you could you could take our giant ground sloth and apply it to whichever uh, genus and species you were looking for. But uh, yeah, we do have a giant ground sloth. Uh, hey, welcome back. <laughs> All right. Uh, one. One more, unless we want to continue going on. <laughs> uh, this is this is kind of an obscure one, and it's a it's just far enough back that it might not have made the cut, and I would understand that. But what about uh, a chalicothier? Come again? A chalicothier. Uh, I think you got me. Chalicotheres were a lineage of animals that I think the last one went extinct about three million years ago. Uh, but they were essentially a cross between a horse and a gorilla. <laughs> and in other words, uh, yeah, they, they were they were large herbivores, but their their front feet were massive and uh, they kind of walked on their knuckles, almost like a giant ground sloth. But these animals lived in the old world and uh, they were not really capable of running, but they must have been a they must have been able to defend themselves from large ice age predators. Uh, they had the they had these three giant wolverine like claws on them. Uh, but just look them up. They were very interesting. Uh, Chalicotheres. Yeah. Yeah, that one's not in the book. Uh, we we have two Pliocene creatures, the Megalodon and the Terror Bird. Uh, and the Pliocene would have been around 5 million to 2.5 million years ago. And then the Pleistocene, the last Ice Age, would have been uh, 2.5 million to 11,000 years ago. And that was the that was as far back as we went. So no uh... bird for the wind, dude. Holker <laughs> actually taught me about uh, the Terror Bird, which is why it is in Dreadlore. And yes! <laughs> that is... That is a... That's a... Foul hot beast. Uh, yeah, that in the um, oh fuck, what is it? What's the, it's the giant sloth? What is it called? Yeah, the, the ground sloth, sloth, megatherium. Yeah, yeah, megatherium. That guy, megatherae is what I called it. Yeah, it's cool. It's a cool book. Um, yeah, wow. I had a bunch of questions. Yeah, I do. Um, are you guys finished up with those questions or were you just like? going through well, cool science stuff. Hulker was just going through. Um, <laughs> I did yeah, have a question. Apologies, Lucas. Usually it's not a shit show for technology this bad. <laughs> no worries, man. <laughs> as long as you get the audio you need, I'm happy. Yeah. Uh, you were saying earlier that with the book being out, you weren't for sure. Like, 
how you could use it to continue the conservative like charity aspect of it um have you thought any more like like different ways that you could do that using D&D and stuff like that have you ever thought about I uh there's a lot of good uh academic research at this point to prove that uh, tabletop role-playing games have a unique effect on the way people approach their subject matter. Um, people are starting to look into how it can be used for therapy um, mm, or yeah. uh, for teaching social skills and a lot of really incredible things. Um, and I think it's going to involve a certain amount of creativity. Uh, I don't want to say too much and I don't want to like overpromise, um, but I have worked with people who are, you know, uh, our next one of our stretch goals was to build a study guide for this thing uh, to be able to, something portable to be able to give to educators in a school environment and see how they can use it. Um, we we have some ideas for uh, events that could be hosted by zoos or other museums or people who are um, looking to bring a wider audience to the projects they're already doing. And uh, we really need we really wanted to make sure the book was the best it could be before we started uh, pursuing that pretty heavily. So. That's kind of the next step for this thing is to to find the people who um, who have a use for this, uh, to show people who don't know they have a use for this that how it can be used for what they're doing, um, and to find partners like the Center for Biological Diversity who can really help us get the most out of this new tool. Um, so, in the event that someone were to want to do that, uh, how would they contact you guys? Yeah, you can, uh, depending on when you're finding this or when this airs, you can always find us at maychanpress.com. There's a contact page there and a support page, and that'll um, that'll get you to the team, and uh, we'll be in touch. Magehandpress.com? Yep. Yeah, right on. This is for contact. Yeah, it's it's all like noble and shit, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I'm, I also am a part of a charity organization. So like that was what take a uh, wild guess as to what his charity organization is, Lucas. Uh, Look at him. <laughs> uh oh, bluegrass beard. <laughs> Wait, what? Uh, yeah, that's the we are we're beard and loathing in Kentucky. And oh, we okay. We have beard competitions and stuff like that, but we do different things and raise money for different charities. So that's where yeah, I was I like you know, like you could take it and like do like a module, like create like a module that teaches about conservation and then do it at packs or that sort of thing. So that could help. Yeah. Get, and that was part of the, the DNA of the project from the beginning. It comes with a companion adventure called The Last Owlbear. Uh, D&D players love owlbears. If you don't know what an owlbear yeah. is. Yes, it's in the do. D&D movie. You, yes, you do. It's an owl and a bear, and you just push yeah. them together, and that's it's yeah. the coolest thing you've ever seen. One uh, of my characters so, fought alongside one. <laughs> exactly. And everyone, everyone who's played D anD D for any significant length of time has a story about one of these things. So we mm. imagined, what if, you, what if there was one left, uh, just one? It's your job to go and get it, and now you have to figure out what happens next. It's the last uh, again, unicorn a, day. Yeah. Uh, the last unicorn. There's a whole lot of the last unicorn in Book of Extinction. Yeah, a whole lot of Studio <laughs> Ghibli as well. But that adventure gave us a, a lot of opportunity to like put those things into mechanical terms that we had been learning uh, as we put the book together, like the ways in which species go extinct and how we have to work to save them, and how much harder that is after the species is no longer abundant. Uh, you know, we were able to kind well, of especially if it's just one. I mean. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we were able to put that in uh, in game terms and explore what that means and give players the opportunity to encounter that question in a way where they had the potential to change the outcome in ways that most people just don't. Uh, in the sounds, real world. It sounds like uh, it'd be a really cool anime. Speaking of Studio <laughs> Ghibli. <laughs> like, that's a badass anime. You got like, you know, the, uh, what is it? <clears throat> Not Princess Mononoke. What's the one everyone watches? I'm, my geek card is is gone uh whisper wind whispers oh, yeah. wind. Fucking, wind no nausicaa is so it's my favorite anime actually is nausicaa no this is the one um where you got the the big ghost with the mask and he eats gold oh, oh no he uh, gives gold away thank you jesus christ spirited <laughs> away uh we got like you know the 10 year old girl or whatever who goes off and like almost like ash but like instead of trying to capture <laughs> Pokemon, 
Uh, I can't believe I fucking remembered Pokemon. <sighs> but you know, she she she's got her fucking team, and uh, they go, uh, you know, get animals and shit. Yeah. Um, I'm giving you gold here. I'm giving you gold. I mean, <laughs> I, seriously, this is the first moment where I ever considered making an animated show out of this thing. You need to make a goddamn <laughs> anime. You can have people Ooh, like dress it. up like these fucking characters. <laughs> you could have a fucking show, dude. <laughs> it's badass. And then get like Greta Thunberg or something. She, you could play her. She could be in there and just be mean <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> Although I think she's too old now. She's like, you know, 12. She's way too old. That's... Uh, Come on, go on. I mean, I I, she yeah, I'm just seriously. I think she's like 20 years old or something now. Yeah, she's she's been in the public eye for a long time. Uh, Is she still in the public eye? I think so. Not nearly. Yeah, so she's much, around. Still doing that same kind of work. Um, she's still <laughs> trying to solve the problem that made her really mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, speaking of extinction, uh, has an eccentric billionaire with an island off the coast of Costa Rica contacted you uh, <laughs> with an offer to spend a weekend um, seeing what, what he has created uh, and uh, maybe asked you to, to sign an NDA. Um, <laughs> will there be a crew joining you of, of he others? There's no expense. There's no, <laughs> it's, there's no expense. Has that, has, has that happened to you recently? Uh, in a way, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One of the weirdest, uh, one of the weirdest things about doing this this project was the the people who who came alongside it that I didn't expect. Um, when we uh, uh, one of the conventions we went to, we had the big banner up, Book of Extinction, and uh, the guys from outside Xbox, uh, the Ox Venture team, one of the one of the first YouTube channels to really jump on the actual play genre, uh, and you know still great at it. Um, swung by and said, hey, do you want to sponsor a couple episodes? Our next adventure is called Extinction and it's about an eccentric billionaire who is using necromancy to bring back dinosaurs, etc. And we were like, yes, <laughs> absolutely, we would like to do that. Uh, <laughs> now, how are you sponsoring it? Uh, we, um, you know, it was a, they, they had a rate for, for a sponsored episode in a way that they did that, but um, we sent them over a copy of the book. They uh, they took a look at it and worked it into the story. So there's a couple Ox Venture episodes out there um, with That's the cool. skin taker, the steam ink I mentioned earlier, and uh, the thylacine, um, the Tasmanian tiger. Uh, it's still an icon for extinction. And they they crushed it. Um, they they really got kind of the gut punch for it, uh, and they they got a way to play it for comedy, which is really hard to do uh, when mm. you're talking about extinction. Um, yeah. And a couple of people who ended up backing the project were like, I am here because of Ox Venture uh, and for no other reason. I'm like, great. I'm glad to have you. <laughs> That's really cool. Uh, speaking of sponsors, hey, Holker, yeah. who's our sponsor tonight? Uh, tonight's sponsor is food that is three to five days past its expiration date. Go ahead. Eat it. Pray about it. You paid for it already, so why not? Still good. Put it in the microwave if you're still worried. <laughs> you know, I, uh... I love my I love my expired microwave milk. <laughs> oh, no, no, go ahead. Thick. Yeah, you're gonna have a uh, you have some extinct speed. Anyway, uh, yeah, I I went to. I went to McDonald's. It's been a while since I've been to McDonald's. But I went to McDonald's a while ago. And, uh, you know, got the double cheeseburger, whatever deal that they don't have. I don't know. Two cheeseburgers. And then I forgot about it. Um, I guess I just kind of put them underneath my seat. <laughs> oh, no. I don't know why. I could have put them over there, but I didn't. Put them underneath my seat and I forgot and I came back yeah I came back uh, and found them and was like holy shit I got two hamburgers the thought process was well it's not too hot outside yet <laughs> and I've I've been in the shade that's where I parked <laughs> so it's probably okay 
<laughs> and I well, ate they... those hamburgers. They tasted fine. I mean, they tasted like McDonald's. With a little something extra. Um, I did not get sick. I did not get sick. Then again, McDonald's isn't actually food. So, <laughs> you know, it's a... Uh... So, man. Lucas, tell us... Um, tell us the dirt, man. Uh, when it comes to conservation, who sucks? <laughs> uh, who do we boycott? <laughs> who do we boycott? Like right now, like today? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I genuinely don't have an answer. Um, I can tell you my very short list of actual factual bad guys from sure. from history of extinction. Uh, let me pull this up so I don't get the name wrong. And uh, with apologies to whoever's. Uh, to any living relatives of this man, mm. but I do think he messed up pretty bad. Cool, they're likely rich, so whatever. Uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I mentioned the Japanese wolf earlier, and uh, the uh, the wolf in Japan had a fundamentally different role in its ecosystem than the wolf does in America. Like, when I say wolf to an American, what they think about is something uh, wild and dangerous and probably uh, uh, predatory in a way that's indiscriminate. But when you talked about a wolf to a Japanese person, at least up to a certain point in history, they saw something that was uh, a benefactor, a guardian. Because for the for most of what you raise on Japan, I mean, it's the island of a thousand reeds, uh, you raise rice or grain products. So. Um, mm the wolf was the thing that kept the deer and the boar at bay, the thing that was going to eat your crop. The wolf was a partner in that way. Um, when you, uh, when you're a rancher in Montana and what you raise is cattle, the wolf is a competitor for your livelihood. Uh, so I get it. You know, it's very hard to look at this whole thing and say, I don't understand why you made the choices that you made. Uh, most of what I say is, we know better now, and we don't have an excuse anymore. Um, uh, during what's known as the Meiji Restoration, or... Uh, Meiji Restoration, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, there was... 1868 uh, or something like this? I guess. think so. Let me roll yeah. it over. Uh, but yeah, there was this big movement in Japan to bring a lot of Western culture over. And what they brought... Mm. Uh, one of the things that they brought was Western attitudes about agriculture. And one of the hangers-on to that was our attitude towards the wolf. Yeah, killing um, fucking wolves. Mm -hmm. so That's was, what we uh, do. <laughs> yeah, and actually, here's Ohio again. Um, in fucking Ohio, man. I know. God. In 1873, the government appointed an Ohio rancher named Edwin Dunn to oversee the establishment of a modern livestock industry in, the, in Japan. Mm. And Dunn enforced the killing of wolves with institutionalized bounties for wolf pelts and uh, what's known as strychnine baiting. Oh, no. Uh, where you leave a corpse out for a predator to find that's laced with strychnine. Uh, Lord. Uh, it's basically a poison trap, but for every mm -hmm. wolf, every every target animal that that kills, it kills uh, a, a number of other creatures as well, because it's... Sure. It, it's not, it's, not it's indiscriminate, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the... Most experts agree that that campaign worked. Um, the last credible record of a wild Japanese wolf was in 1905. Um, so yeah, we can pin it on one guy's recommendation uh, to a degree in the way that we can pin almost in insofar as we can pin anything to to one person. Um, but that was a definite nail in the coffin. His name was Dunn. <laughs> Dunn, Dun, UN. Um, <laughs> oh no, I got it. No, I got it. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're 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 all from Kentucky, okay? <laughs> and we don't like Ohio. Um, <laughs> uh, do you? Are you in Ohio? I am. Uh, I'm not from here originally, though. Uh, I'm from Illinois. No one is. No one yeah, is. Yeah, it's weird. We just people just end up here. Um, I'm from yeah. Illinois, and we have an irrational hatred for Indiana that is. Yeah. No, that's not irrational at all. You from Chicago? Illinois. It's not <laughs> irrational. <laughs> No, not Chicago. I'm from rural Illinois, which makes mm. it worse. <laughs> where, where, well, if you don't mind saying, it's not Springfield. Uh, North Central, uh, just just small town mm. near the state line. Yeah, did you go to uh, Gen Con quite a bit? I'm thinking uh, Indianapolis. Yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. start weirdly. I didn't start going to Gen Con until uh, I started working in the space. My first Gen Con was twenty twenty two. 
Well, yeah. I only went a couple times. So, D&D, uh, this is a question I was going to ask before. Um, yeah, your your book is dealing with Fifth Ed. Mm -hmm. Do you know where I'm going with this? I don't. Uh, you're giving well, me they're coming out with a new edition. <laughs> in, in, in typical D&D fashion, you know, they, they, they want to make a new edition, and they want you to buy a lot of different books. And now, I don't, I think it's D&D 1, I think is what it is. For some reason, they're not doing D&D 6. Why? I don't know. And it's all on Xbox. I've heard yeah, a I couple so. of, it's had a couple of different names uh, over the course of it. Uh, we heard <clears throat> one D&D, &D. we heard D&D &D Next, I think that might have been the... Well, D&D &D Next was originally 5th Ed. It was 5e. E. Um, now, they may, they may have... I haven't I haven't listened to uh what is it profession Dun professor dungeon master dungeon whatever the fuck his name is he's youtube guy he's pretty pretty good shit um actually really good shit if you if you want your D&D &D news um and does a bunch of minis and stuff I don't know why I'm promoting his channel he <laughs> would not review my book and uh he uh, has like I think 1300,000 billion subscribers so he doesn't need any more uh legitimacy but truth be told professor dungeon master rocks and rolls oh. anyway D, D one so if they're coming out with another version and i know the version is quite different in terms of apparently it is we'll put in quotes very inclusive uh which is to say there aren't they're trying to get away from racial bonuses and penalties because that is apparently bigotry or promotes bigotry right because okay. if you're a race and you have a plus two then ooh, your race kind of thing uh perhaps that's a thing um there's a mechanical aspect there i don't know if that really deals at all with the monsters i don't know if you know they they kind of like the difference between third ed and fifth uh because we we skip we, we skip this this, this doesn't exist, right? Um, in third ed, there's base attack. And in fifth, there's like proficiency bonus, right? So that's a pretty hefty mechanical mechanical change. Did you play third ed at all? Uh, no, I got my start in fourth edition. That which yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. What? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think I, I know what you're getting at, though. Is uh, uh, are you asking how it's gonna how it's gonna make the jump? Yeah, is your is your book gonna be outdated before it's even published? Uh, we don't know. Um, we had we had some the, the the publication date for the next edition of Dungeons and Dragons, whatever it's called, mm. uh, has been moved a couple of times and moved. Yeah, because they're running into a lot of problems. Yeah, it's it's uh, you know you know this. It's hard to make a book. It takes a lot of time. Uh, and even yeah. when done with it, it takes a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, so I understand completely. Um, what. Uh, it's we don't know what we don't know how much it's going to change there's uh I've, I've heard that it's going to be backwards compatible i've heard that they're going to try and merge the mechanics that'd be cool that'd be things. really cool it'd be great but you know it's it's we're, we're kind of taking it as it comes uh and every third party publisher i know every everyone who's who's writing for dungeons and dragons is just kind of uh at this point we're just going to wait and see i do know yeah. that uh the book i think is a is a complete statement uh, for fifth edition, I think it's a product of its time. Um, I think it does fifth edition really well, and I know at, mm. even for for a while after, for a while at least after the next edition comes out, there's still going to be a player base for fifth edition. Loads. People are still playing second ed. Yeah, I mean it, it, yeah. it persists for a while. Thaco went extinct. Hmm. Thaco did go extinct. Yeah, Thaco uh, went yeah. extinct. And, and well, Holker mentioned something earlier. Um, you know, a lot of, or so in errata, uh, depending on the differences, and not that you haven't thought about this, of course, <laughs> but depending on the differences, it's not, so a lot of people took, you know, the second ed uh, modules. It's where Planescape came from. And speaking yeah, yeah. of, that's, I mean, I, on episode six of Solar Punk, when you're talking about that, you talked a lot about uh, um, Planescape and the oh, astral for, realm. Huh? For listening. Yeah, no, I, 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 I went deep in the paint, baby. <laughs> um, I got so many notes. Anyway, 
uh, also you pronounce sigil in the right fucking way. You get it? Yes. <laughs> apparently, apparently, you're actually supposed to pronounce it sigil. I couldn't tell. According, you. Uh, according to the person who made it. This is what I gotta say to that motherfucker. Sigil is fucking stupid. <laughs> it's sigil. If you're gonna spell it S I G I L, you go straight to hell, sir. You go straight, go straight to fucking Beator, all right? And suck my dick on the way. All right. You pronounce sigil well. Uh, sorry. Here's my question. If D and D one or the next D and D or whatever is pretty different. Will you guys take the time to put out something that can translate between the two deals? And that, that was my point of yeah. people took second ed and uh, piped it into third, and then they even did it to fifth. And it sucks yeah. in fifth, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, it depends on how much it changes. Um, it's entirely possible that uh, it will stand as written. Um, mm. And we try to keep it current with some of the design trends that even fifth edition has even been changing over the time. I know we had to, yeah, we had to rework our, we had a, we had a bunch of werewolves, a bunch of lycanthropes in the book. Uh, and we had to work them, rework them pretty strongly, even from when we started writing the book back in uh, 2021. So um, we kept it as current as we could. I don't know how much the edition is going to change. Uh, if it does, I'm going to see, I'm going to try and see that this thing uh, has a future and a life uh, after after this statement of it, but um, again, we're going to take that as it comes, and we're going to. It doesn't seem like it's a big deal as, as best we can. Because it sounds it sounds like the main the main stay of 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 your book is that uh, it's relevant regardless of the edition. Like even yeah. if it's even if it's an outdated edition, it's still cool as shit, and it's actually real yeah. information yeah. and lore. I mean, that's gonna, <laughs> that's going to last. Um, that's going to last a long time. Yeah. Interesting. Um, what's the challenge rating of these uh, extinct things, assuming you bring them uh, to the game? Uh, we've got the full gamut, um, I think. That's more than the Monster Manual of Fifth Ed does. They favor, <laughs> I want to say it's, I, I'm not 100% on this, but I want to say it's like 12th and below, 12th level. Because, you know, once you get to the higher levels of Fifth Ed, um, uh, I don't know. I fucking hate that, that to be completely honest with you, but whatever. Once whatever. you have the own game. Once you get the uh, higher levels, you have a character who's actually using that uh, Vecna and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, fucking... high, high level play is wild, and most people never get there. Um, no, it's so... it's 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 just not as fun. They they didn't make the game for high level. I mean, they've been admitted, uh, or they've been documented admitting that hey, look. The bell curve is what we're going for. You know, people yeah. don't want to play first level. They want to play third to about 12, maybe 15. Yeah. And I mean, that's been my experience. I mean, it takes a long time. Uh, Americans move on average every once every four years. Um, and it can take that long to get through 10 levels of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> um, we tried to we tried to support as wide a, a player experience as we could. Uh, <laughs> our, our CR range is from zero to 22. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we had we had to do a duck. Like, <laughs> <laughs> did you say Americans move on average? <laughs> say that again. Americans move on average once every four years. Uh, <laughs> oh, you mean like move houses, or do you mean like, like move out of their seats? Oh yeah, no, they just all, <laughs> oh, they just, just fucking dig it. <laughs> yes, you did a duck. Is the did you give them cool like powers and shit, or is it just like, look at this noble duck that fucking got killed by oil? Uh, we we tried to give everybody uh, a, a unique trait at least, or an mm. interesting thing that they could do. Um, sort of a fantasy really, type thing. Yeah, that got really hard when what we were dealing with was a bird about yay big. Right. Uh, <laughs> so you know, there's some of them that are just like the game does not have enough variety. Like one hit point is one hit point when you get down right. to right. No D and D sucks. I know. Yeah. But uh, so yeah, I mean, it was important to us to to render the the animal as it actually was. So I have a stat mm. block for an individual passenger pigeon, um, 
and then you know that that just carried through so we ended up having there is a step what if we're just stuck. so what if in the fantasy version of the passenger pigeon it had teeth <laughs> oh my god <laughs> we, uh it didn't need teeth the passenger what did it do was a, the passenger pigeon was a biological storm it was a, a natural phenomenon more than anything uh, this was a volume of birds that could break the limbs off of trees when they landed. It would blot out the sky for hours at a time. This is one of those things where I didn't have to change much about it at all to make it D&D as heck. Uh, Whoa. It made it a swarm. And like a so really, it's a swarm. Really big, it's just a swarm. That is it like one, one swarm? One <laughs> like, swarm. Oh, God. It's at, yeah, it's at the center of a, a cloud of birds a mile wide. Uh, Jesus. Because that's what it was. Um, this is one of those instances in which I like I didn't have to change it. Like this is so wild and alien and insane to to a modern audience that this could ever exist. That that is a monster all on its own. Wow. Now what's their challenge rating? The, or the challenge story? or whatever it is called now. Oh, let me let me see if I can find it. It's moved a couple of times since I wrote it. I understand, man. I've I've written many versions of the book and. <laughs> It's very oh. easy to forget. Uh, CR nine. Yeah. Wow. That's rough. That's rough. Passenger, passenger pigeon. Fuck yeah. Um. Right. So that was the whole sigil thing. Um. Uh. Why did people get? Okay. It's a little bit away from uh, your book. It's more about your podcast, which I know. Sure. You said you said before we started. Um, the podcast Making a Monster, which I thought was really good. I mean, it's it's very interesting um, the way that you you edited it, edited it, edited it, edited it, edited it <laughs> uh, and and I all that stuff. That <laughs> um, you know, yeah, uh, it, you've stepped back for the last year from it, but all the episodes are on your website, and you are potentially going to start it up again, or what? Yeah, I didn't mean to stop doing it. There's a couple episodes that I recorded and never released that I, I mm. really wanted to. Um, it's just one of those, like, man, uh, there's only so much time in the day. Um, oh, I feel that. I, I'm still trying to figure out uh, how to handle that project. It, I, I loved it. I learned so much, and I met so many interesting people, and there's still, I think, I don't think there's ever going to be an end to that conversation because we're still making new monsters and we're still remixing the old ones. Mm. Um, so, you know, I would love for there to be new episodes. If there's not, then I'm trying to be honest about that. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying not to feel like shame and regret. I haven't put out an episode in a while. Uh, <laughs> How often did you put out those episodes? Oh, when I started, it was once a week because I was naive. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, that's... <laughs> Fucking terrible idea. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was uh, it was a good time. Or, or it was it was good at the time, and I had I had access to the the people and the the you know my life was such that I could I could handle that production schedule. Um, there's a version of it that's once every two weeks, or maybe a version of it that's once a month. But even that's like it's always it's always meant to be short. Um, I didn't want to make a a giant. I was looking at actual play podcasts that can run for four hours or more, and I was like, I don't yeah, those. I don't know why people do those. I mean, it's there's a place for. <laughs> <laughs> there's a place for that like and there were people do that well i couldn't um i wanted to make something that was bite size. i wanted to drive at that point as quickly and as i could i wanted you to see the whole story in an amount of time that you could easily remember it sure uh so you know see, i'm not going for that i'm not going for that <laughs> i have yeah. i have two campaigns uh both of these characters are in they play characters in the campaigns and my goal when you when you listen to uh, the Red Rit on Monday night, or into space into on Monday night, space. Uh, I don't want you to have any fucking clue what's going on. As a listener, <laughs> I want you to be like, like as daunted as like, like like someone who's like, oh yeah, Supernatural's a good show, and you're like, fuck you, <laughs> fuck you. That's where I want you to be in my actual play game. How else? You know what I'm saying? Like people watch it and they're like, I don't get what's going on. It's like, of course not. There's literally hundreds of hours. Yeah. Yeah. Of me, me 
<laughs> Bitching. <laughs> Why would you not want to listen to this? So you want a bite-sized... A bite-sized podcast. How long did this episode run? Usually about half an hour. Unless I had something really fun to do. Um, there were, there were, I, I got indulgent, uh, a couple of, th- I think the longest I ever did was, uh, just over an hour, maybe an hour. Yeah. Ago. Yeah. Um, you, you seemed rather excited about that one and it was, <laughs> it was pretty good. It was pretty good. Uh, the yes. only issue that I have of the website is the embeds, which I, I shouldn't talk. I was just fucking with the dreadlore.com, huh? Well, website and the embeds the fucking website. suck. Uh, you can't, you can't scroll back and forth on mobile. Or at least I I did I couldn't figure it out. I'm not. I'll look into that. Please. I'm saying I couldn't do it. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> um, so <laughs> why did people move around a few times? Free league fucking sucks. <laughs> I don't understand why people love D20 so much. Like, what is the fucking hard on that people oh, have for D20? The, uh, yeah. The game product. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't understand. So episode fifteen. <laughs> oh yeah, was this? Uh, I've done a couple of free league episodes. Was this Vassen? Nope. Why did people give Mork Borg a chance? Uh, I quote: "All style and no substance." I believe is the the second part. I was looking for the no substance, uh, but I couldn't scroll. Oh yeah, <laughs> like it's cool. I I I backed Death in Space. Yeah. So and I thought it was cool, and and I I, I liked how they did the modules. Um, they remind me of, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're so successful that I just cannot knock it. Their art's cool. <laughs> the idea is cool. It's all cool. And then I'm like, this is D20 filth. <laughs> and I just, yeah, and I, <laughs> yeah, I have a whole thing about rules light. I'm going to let you talk. People play the game for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the same reason, same way that people listen to podcasts for a lot of different reasons. It's for somebody, um, and just because it's not for me doesn't mean that I, I didn't uh, I didn't want to cover it and I didn't want to like look for what was valuable and interesting in it. Um, and I have. Well, I'm not knocking you for for interviewing the guy or whatever. <laughs> it's fine. I just don't understand the fucking hard on. Yeah, I don't. For um, for Morkborg. I mean, it's cool, but I'm pretty confused as well. Um, the I still haven't played a Morkborg game, uh, even after uh, interviewing people who, who, who write from Morkborg. Um, but I, I can see the appeal of a game that you don't have to prep for, uh, a game where everyone rolls and nothing is predictable and uh, everything happens within the confines of the experience. Uh, so, you know, I, there, there's there's something there. Um, I get it. Yeah, I've played Cards Against Humanity. You know, I <laughs> I get the idea of of. Uh, uh, I guess what what I'm looking for in in a, in a tabletop role playing game, what drew me to it was the lore, was the community, um, was getting into the game and using your character and and all these things, uh, telling a story. Um, even if you're playing, what is it? Uh, OSR, old school type games as in like heart dude i'm talking about yeah uh osr being old school revival i couldn't give yeah. you a list of the games that qualify it seems to be sort of unofficial no. yeah, it's, it's a whole category. bunch of whatever yeah uh it's it's the kind of game where you go into the dungeon why no you're not even asking why you're just oh, in yeah, the fucking yeah. dungeon Extremely. you're in the dungeon you do the thing and you go back to the dungeon you know and it's it's your role playing in the sense of Hulker's playing the wizard. I'm playing the barbarian. Yeah. You're playing the, and sure you can give them personalities, but that's far a far cry yeah, from it's not like fifth ed, right? Where it's like, oh well, my character's a barbarian because, mm-hmm. you know, and oh I'm gonna leave the whatever. No, you're not gonna leave the dungeon because you want gold. <laughs> that's the game. It's kind of OSR. Yeah, if that's what the game tells you to do. Then sure. So your interest in Morkborg and Free League and such was was simply, it's popular, it's interesting, you want to know more about it. Well, they were saying something, and people were listening. And more importantly, they were they were saying something from the perspective of a culture that I'm not part of. Um, like, this is Nordic role-playing. Sure. Vassen was, sure. was specifically this Nordic role-playing. 
and that's they handle monsters differently up there uh mm. they like they i mean every culture does but like they and they couldn't help but come at it from a different perspective um i liked what they added to the conversation uh, mm. i liked the way that game talked about monsters and had a different approach from the kind of uh very prescriptive numbers heavy monster manual approach where this is the stat block and this is what it does exactly and this is the precise numerical value we put on this mm. monster's functioning right um and anyone who works in conservation will tell you that it's never as simple as putting things on a spreadsheet even the idea of giving something a genus name and a species name the way carl linnaeus did the way we understand it now is fairly recent in terms of human history and there are other ways of talking about the natural world that may be just as valuable um so yeah i that was my interest in free league uh they 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 knew what they were doing they knew what they were saying and they said it well uh and um that i think that i think was enough to kind of to kind of bring them in and, and see what they added to this to, to the conversation i summon holker <laughs> what tell us about <laughs> genus and species and the new you're telling me a long time ago not a long time yeah ago. so uh, what i was telling you about was that was i remember what i was trying to tell you i was telling you about um the old paradigm where you had genus and species but then you also had things like family order class uh phylum and whatnot these were sort of uh, ways of grouping animals that were obviously at the time uh, more similar to each other and then putting them in more uh, progressively all-encompassing uh, classifications. So we're, we're all mammals, so that we're all in the class mammalia. Uh, but we're also primates, so we're in the order uh, primate. I, I, I don't I don't know what what the exact Latin name is, but we're primates, so we're in that order, and uh, we're in a subgrouping uh, of uh, hominoids, which includes all uh, old world monkeys and apes, and then and, and, and on and on and on and on until you get to humans, right? Uh, but then there's also uh, you can look at it from something known as cladistics. Cladistics is 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 uh, something that's now possible because we we have a lot more knowledge of uh, of an animal's uh, genetic relationship with other animals, and so now we know uh, now we know now we know that we're not only mammals but we're also vertebrates, but we're also fish uh, because we don't never really stopped being fish. That that's one way of looking at it. Uh, we're we're amniotes because we are we all descend from an animal that at one point uh, laid eggs, and uh, we're also tetrapods because we all descend from an animal that at one point had four legs. Even though uh, snakes no longer have them, they're still tetrapods from that perspective. All right. Uh, <laughs> that's what I was. Ta that's probably what I was ta talking to you about. Yeah, something like that. Is is that in the deep time thing? It's uh, that's wild. You have a website. I do. It is Scintilla or Skintilla. <laughs> I have a feeling it's Scintilla, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh Scintilla dot studio, is that right? That's right. Um why do you have this website? I know that sounds like a vapid question. It's not. But... Uh, it's one I ask myself every day. Uh, <laughs> now, it's um, it's an incubator. For a while, uh, that, that website existed to sort of gather everything uh, that I was kind of interested in doing and things that, uh, things that I wanted to explore and have some sort of meaningful record of them. Um, and after, you know, after a while, it just became a useful way of, of sharing my portfolio of work. Uh, so yeah, it's still out there. I'm sure there's some, I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff on there that's drastically out of date. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's, it's, uh, it's a good way to, to kind of point people to what I'm doing and, uh, uh, summarize what I've learned. So it's not your main thing right now. Would you, it sounds like that's not the thing that like. Yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't really, um, 
I don't know what it makes. Um, I know what I do. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do a lot of writing and I do a lot of marketing work for, for other companies and uh, I, I, I'm making a lot of games and I'm working with some other publishers and um, Scintilla Studio is a way to kind of gather all of that. Uh, I see. So I can point people at one website rather than saying, rather than sort of truly reflecting the, the reality of my career, which is, yeah, uh, fractional uh, and working with a lot of different people who have their own websites and interests. Um, it's a great way to kind of centralize people getting in touch with me and seeing what it is that I do and finding which part of that massive constellation is interesting to them. Now you're, uh, well, I obviously have, Jesus, I've got a knife. That's going to be good. Um, what are you, uh, what are you writing? Uh, at the moment, um, I'm still writing some things for Extinction. I'm still, uh, I'm still mm. working on some HN press properties. We're doing a lot more dark matter these days. Um, what's also, dark matter? Dark matter is a science fiction conversion for fifth edition. Uh, so everything that you love about 5e, if you love 5e. Hate it all. You know. <laughs> someone that i think you can shoot it into space and play with guns and uh, it, you, in, into space are you talking about into space the uh, <laughs> uh the the fantastic setting actual... into space the dreadlore settings are you talking about uh no <laughs> no you're not it could be should we talk about that <clears throat> no 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 okay no one wants to hear about that i do want to hear more about dark matter though uh yeah let me pull up what Dark Matter's fifth edition, but sci-fi. If neither of those things grab you, then uh, uh, then maybe it's not your book, and that's fine. Oh, I've run fifth edition. <laughs> it's happened before. It's yeah, we um, fine. we tried to get. Uh, gosh, that looks terrible in that lighting. But yeah, Dark Matter is uh, everything. That that's you need a house book, right? Uh, this is how I knew I was in good hands with uh, with Mage Hand. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty pretty slick it, are they doing um crowdfunding on those or uh dark matter is well <laughs> uh dark matter's had its crowdfunding campaign already it's been out for a while sure, sure um we're looking at uh we're looking at doing an upgrade in the near future um, well what my question is is for mage hand press <clears throat> are they essentially do they have idea is it like free league where they have an idea and they crowd crowdsource it and then produce it yeah uh that that general pattern has worked for mage hand quite a bit in the past mm. Mm. um uh, i think the the three things you're going to know mage hand for uh are book of extinction dark matter and Valda's Spire of Secrets, which added a whole bunch of new player options to fifth. That sounds familiar. Then again, I listened to your podcast, so. <laughs> uh, but it, I, I just I haven't kept up a whole lot with with the D twenty thing. I understand why it's it's very popular, um, because people don't know better. But <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what. One of the things that like one of the reasons I'm still playing, or one of the things that hooked me back in 2015, was that this mm. game comes with little math rocks that clicky clack when you toss them. Oh, that's cool shit. <laughs> it's like that's lizard badass. brain likes this. Yes. There we go. And I mean, I get it. It's it's a it's a universal system. Uh that's cool. That's cool. Right. We do support mechs in this game. Yeah. Uh, what kind of sci-fi stuff you want? We'll have it. We'll throw it in there. <laughs> that's neat. So you worked on that one? Uh, I'm working on it now. You're working uh, on it Dark now. Dark Matter was uh, one of the projects that Mage Hand did before I was able to join the team. So you joined the team with Mage Hand, um, and you did this. I was under the impression that you had the Extinction book, and, or Book of Extin Extinction, and then you contacted Mage Hand Press to be yes. a part of it. But it sounds like you were a part of them prior to that. No, I worked myself into a job. <laughs> oh, I see. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're writing for them. Yeah. Yeah. I do writing. Um, I do. I do some marketing work for them as well. Um, yeah. I, I come. I come to this with a background in, in public relations and education. Um, mm. So yeah. You know, I just had this existing skill set. No one. I don't. I have not found anyone who trained to be a writer of games, especially role playing <laughs> games. Um, yeah. Most people come yeah. to this field from a bizarre constellation of different backgrounds mm. mine happened to be marketing and i was able to bring some of that in with me yeah, that's amazing it's it's a such a super fucking power you're like a wizard 
<laughs> um, can you tell me any about functional marketing right now? Let's say as as it pertains to uh well a book because you know there's people and of course <laughs> i'm thinking about my book but people make games and they might get the kickstarter going you know maybe because their friends do it or whatever <laughs> but then what the fuck do you do with it right like yeah. like it seems very difficult especially for a book like what we're talking about you know that book is what to print in color hardback because it's you're not going to print it so, um, uh, paperback because th why would you do that? It's not any cheaper to do that. It's like a thirty to thirty-five dollar book, just base, and that's assuming you're using something like Lulu Press, unless they've got their own press, which would make sense since it's the name. Maybe they're saving uh, money, which I highly doubt. So <laughs> my point is, you buy a hundred of those books, it's like thirty-five hundred dollars. Boom. You dig what I'm saying? Like, how do you? do anything with the book uh how do you market of, it in terms of business margin yeah uh, hmm and how do you think about this and i hear oh it's social media it's like oh fuck yourself social media is bullshit it's not well, bullshit but like if you don't have a following you don't got a following you know uh so i've worked with a lot of uh i'll, I'll give you kind of my um my signature philosophy on, on marketing and I'll, I'll keep it brief and relevant. Um, I've, I've worked with a lot of different companies uh, as a marketing professional. And every time I interact with someone in the C-suite, um, someone who's my boss or who's an executive, their okay. instinct when they say marketing is social media. So what are we mm. doing on social? Um, and that to me is driven by a fear of missing out as though they need to take every possible opportunity to tell as many people as possible about their book, right? Uh, their product. Right. And that's how you do marketing. And it's um, exhausting. It's exhausting. And more to the point, it's not, uh, it's not actually what you want. Um, <laughs> uh, you, so I've, I've also worked with companies like now I'm working with very, very small companies, uh, you know, under 20 people, under 20 employees. Mm. Uh, and for them, time is even more precious. Uh, every marketing like you ha when you are approaching marketing, you have to understand that you are going to miss out on some opportunity somewhere, probably a really good opportunity uh, to tell people about your product. And that has to be fine, because uh, you you have to you have to be driven not by this urgency to tell everyone everywhere all the time, uh, but by the uh, but by an attitude where you're building relationships with people, you're finding the right people as much as possible, and you're doing so in a way that is uh, already a core already core to who you are as a creator or a company or a person. Uh, and that's sustainable for you going forward. Um, your whatever audience you gather doesn't want to see you fail. Uh, so if you're like striving really hard to reach more people at the expense of doing good work and, and delivering on what you are good at doing and the, you know the thing that you want to be able to deliver to people, um, i.e. a really good book, a, a really good gaming experience, then uh, that's that's missing out on the that's missing out on the most valuable part of it um so yeah i think uh i think people think people seem to think of marketing as something it isn't um and people uh are afraid i think to let go of what they can't have uh mm. it's very sort of a monkey's paw um, but i try to tell people to, to focus on the one or two things you do well find one platform just one platform uh, that you can manage in a way that's uh, integral and core to the work you're already doing. Um, a promise that you can keep. For me, that was a bite-sized podcast rather than sort mm. of a long, rather than long-form mm. content. Um, for some people, it's long-form content, and that's like what they love to do, and they do it really well. I hate it. Uh, right, and then like just find the one. Don't try to be everywhere. Just, uh, just build relationships. The other thing that I like to think about hospitality as. Uh, is um is hospitality 
So if you ask someone to buy the book, their first question is going to be, well, how do I do that? And uh, if you haven't thought two or three steps ahead of where your audience is at any given point and try to make that uh, as smooth as possible for them, then I don't think you're doing it right. I think you need to look inward to your like your ecosystem before you look outward to things like social media that are just going to grab people off the street and shout at them. Mm. Um, just like, because uh, I think hospitality is about anticipating needs. So if someone comes into your house, uh, they're going to ask, do, are, do I take my shoes off here? And if you say yes, you need a place for them to put their shoes. They're going to know immediately the answer to that question. Right. Uh, the answer's no. If, <laughs> if you say no, that's fine. Like, okay, come on in. Um, you're going you're like, to find out. <laughs> right, what's the next thing they're going to ask you? you got to be two or three steps ahead of people. Can I have a cup of coffee? I'm already right. making it. Right. Coffee's on the side. Like, that's what I think makes it, that's what I think makes a good host. And I think good marketers are good hosts. Uh, hmm. So get your own, if you, if, if I were to, if you were to bring me on as your marketing guy, that's what I would do first is be like, let's get your house in order. Uh, let's make sure that you are hospital hospitable to people who are coming in and asking about your project and looking at the thing that it's going to give them. And then we'll figure out what's like the one way you're going to get in touch with more people and bring them into your house uh, and have a good time with them. Hmm. That's extremely good advice. Yeah. Thank you. I was, I was thinking about how to apply that to the haunted house. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, yeah. So drizzle, uh, experience that you can't get anywhere else, but like it's gonna, there's some questions. When does it happen? Can I do it in June? Did you do it in June? <laughs> uh, we can, you can do it in July. Wow. Okay. We have a, we have a special event in July. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That's what we were talking about last night. <laughs> right. So, yeah, so he, I mean, he's gold. He's giving you gold. Yeah. I tried to. <laughs> no. That's 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 excellent. And and I think you're completely right because marketing, it's what what business. Huh? Um and you're supposed to be on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and I was telling Jizzle earlier I was actually shouting cuz I was mad. Yeah. Uh I've got like 15 accounts. And that's that's just that's just counting social media. I mean there's like 30 different versions. Oh yeah. I think I think millennials a lot of times I will not I only step up onto this soapbox for a second. <laughs> I think millennials have like 30 to 35 cuz you got more than one Gmail address and all these things and these curated little versions of yourself, these little simulacra of you. Um, and it's an absolute nightmare to maintain, to properly maintain these things. Uh, e every one of them is in its own ecosystem and has a purpose. Um, and it's like we, we just kind of don't use it that way. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Very interesting. Do what um, well, and people will find you. So... I I know you like the shorter form content. About how much <laughs> time do you have? Uh yeah, I've got time. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> how much time? <laughs> uh I've got a few more questions for you uh All concerning right. a lot of it concerns your podcast cuz that's what uh, I was seeing on the website. Yeah. Um and um now. Okay, cool. Well, let's take let's take like a let's take a good five minute break. We can get some drinkage, use the El Baño if need be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Holker can entertain us with his uh, beautiful singing voice. <laughs> uh, normally, I would post music, but I don't have any music for this. So, well, and also, yeah, in this is pre-recorded. You can edit it out. Well, we're online now. We're actually, oh, we actually are live. Yeah, we actually are wow. live. I have yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't tell shit. Because uh, <laughs> my computer, my com dude, my computer like just ate shit. It ate shit. I have so many computers. They all ate shit. Finally got back online. It's horrible. Cats and dogs living together. Fuck <laughs> uh, let me see if I can find something cool. Um, Hey, Drizzle. Yes. I didn't do the intro or any of that shit. 
because uh, I was. Mad. I don't know what the intro is for this because I'm not usually. Basically, it's the same <laughs> thing. It's fine. I'll fucking do it. I just. Hi, everyone. We've been doing this for like two hours. This is a Geeky Gamer podcast. We're here with Lucas Zellers. Lucas, would you like to say hello? Two hello. and a half hours in. This is my voice. And the name <laughs> this is your voice. Do it. Yeah. Uh, who, who else do we have with us? You guys introduce yourselves. Uh, I'm the Drizzle. Oh, we did. We did at the beginning talk. Introduce ourselves again. again. <laughs> we just did. Well, I'm just saying we, we didn't go through like the actual Geeky Gamer intro yeah. earlier, but we did introduce ourselves. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm Drizzle. Uh, you can see me Monday nights in the in the Dreadlord TTPRG different letters. Um, I think I messed them up there, but uh, <laughs> no, nah, you got it. Yeah, uh, but yeah, um, a little bit of gamer, but mainly just one campaign for lots of years, as opposed to having a lot of experience in a whole bunch of different campaigns. Uh, Daniel. Daniel. Wow. Yeah, my name is uh, Daniel Holker, and oh. I can touch my thumb to uh, my arm. Can you really? So can yeah. I. <laughs> Perform for <Boy>. me. <laughs> Perform. Oh, my God. To do that. <laughs> Dear God. What monster are you? You should be more specific, Holker. Yeah. <laughs> I can do that, too. <laughs> Wait, can you? What? Just oh, indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Uh, right, so I would play music, but you know, Spotify requires me to log in. Everything at the GGP, at the Geeky Gamer Podcast, this is what I want to leave you with before we go on break. Everything sucks. And, right. oh, and uh, we like, missed. <laughs> Did I really? <laughs> yeah, of yeah, course. everything sucks. Of course. Of course. <laughs> at least on my screen, you fellas. Of course. So my girlfriend uh, sent, bought, and sent me um, ashwagandha. This, oh. I am down. Have you guys ever heard of this stuff? It's got I some have, other, yeah. dude. I know it's like homeopathic roots or something, but it results this should, yeah, <laughs> this should like, like actually evens my horrid mood. I told her, I was like, oh, yeah, I ran out of it like last week. And she was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> it got me some shit. I told Drizzle before we started this, I was like, I am awful. Yep. You know, is it an excuse? Maybe it's an excuse. Maybe it's an excuse. Okay. okay. Are you ready? I am, yeah. All right. Uh, what's on your shelf? Uh, obviously, D&D books. And what else? See a sewing machine? Yeah. Uh, man, this I I think shelves are black magic. Because uh, mm. you can put stuff in them, then I think it should really be possible. Uh -huh. um, I put a bunch of stuff in there uh, from my life. That's my that's my D&D shelf. That's my mini shelf. Um, if, you ever go, if you find yourself going to a lot of gaming conventions, you should know that these are like pop-up shops and they're extremely addictive. Mm. Um, mm. So instead of like going way overboard and buying too much stuff at every convention I go to, I get one painted mini and I put it on the shelf. <laughs> oh, badass. That's uh, badass. Next to it are a couple of birds and butterflies from my from my grandpa, who is uh, uh, an avid uh, wildlife painter. Mm -hmm. And um, just some family photos and things. That's cool. It's a cool shelf, too. It's like, uh, is the... the I, this is my own curiosity. Is the wall actually... Uh, like a polygon there or is that just the shelf no, popping out from the corner <laughs> very cool man yeah and the sewing machine what are you sewing uh that's my wife or what is someone yeah uh she makes a lot of her own clothes i'm actually wearing something she sewed for me that's cool as shit yeah uh can we see it i mean oh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right on. Um, Sewing also feels like can, black magic, so we have it. It is. It's wizardry. <laughs> uh, what are some conventions that are good to, to go to, or I should say that you go to? Uh, I mean, my circuit is um, Origins, uh, Origins Game Fair mm, in Columbus, Ohio. Right. 
that's the local. Um, <clears throat> one of the chillest cons I've ever been to. Uh, mm. Gen Con bills themselves as the best four days in gaming, and I think it's true because uh, everyone goes to Gen Con. Everybody goes. Everybody goes to Gen. Like if you want to see everything, go to Gen Con. Uh, it's very fun. D and D, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a lot more accessible um, than than some of the other conventions. And uh, the only other one I've been to is uh, PAX Unplugged, mm. uh, Philadelphia, in December. Um, so you so have not been to. Uh, Dragon Con. I haven't been to Dragon Con, no, but I've heard good things about it. Yeah, Dragon Con is uh that's that's a wild experience. That's wild. <laughs> I've been I've been two or three times and it's just bigger and bigger and uh it's a different feel. Like Gen Con is more of a family feel when I when yeah. I went. Yeah, I think um, gamers are a lot more chill in general than <clears throat> other convention goers. Like because we would love to sit down and play board games for like three or four hours. Uh, sure. And that's, you know, that that can be pretty family friendly. It lends itself to a certain kind of experience. Um, they have that at Dragon Con. Uh, they had it in, in the bottom. You got like <laughs> three, you know, it, but it was this massive room and it had a it had a, a more of a Gen Con feel in the in the basement. But everywhere else, it's cosplay in panels and lots of BDSM. <laughs> a lot of kink down at the, at the Dragon Con. Whole lot. Which is fun! Different strokes, baby. For different folks. Not really much of a tabletop thing. So you go to Origins, which I've heard of. Yeah. Uh, you go to PAX Unplugged, which I had not. And then, of course, Gen Con. Um, which ones are you promoting what you do? Uh, basically, everywhere I go... Um, I, I do love going to conventions because I can like go on Twitter and be like, hey, who's at Origins? And then like three or four very nice nerds will show up and we'll have a great conversation. <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm doing, uh, I didn't start going to conventions until uh, I, I started, uh, you know, until I had, until it was part of my job. And uh, uh, I do panels. Yeah, you're a late bloomer, dude. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um. I do panels at conventions I go to, um, so I'll be I'll be running a full day of panels at Origins. Um, basically, all. It's a lot. The day. Now they you got them, involved. Go on, sorry. They put them all on the same day, so ordinarily it's spread out over the weekend. But I I don't know. I guess they're trying they're like, to like nah, -uh. this year. Thursday, okay. baby. Now is this all through Black Magic, or I'm sorry, um, Mage Mage uh, Mage Hand Press. Yeah, Mage Hand is going to be at Origins this year for the first time. Um, I, I've been going for a couple of years because it's my home con, or like I can drive there instead of getting a hotel. Uh, so, is that why you're doing panels? I guess is what, what's your entry yeah, into panels? I, uh, uh, I spent some time as an adjunct instructor. Um, I, I teach public speaking sometimes. You mentioned education, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so for a lot of people, the idea of going to a convention and standing in front of 25 people to tell them about your work and what you care about would be absolutely terrifying. Uh, yeah. To me, that's really exciting. Um, so it was really easy for me to put together. And when I found out that was a, a good way to, to fund my convention experience, then uh, I jumped in feet first. Uh, so How'd you get involved with it? Um, there's a... Origin puts Origins puts out a call for presenters and uh, hmm. uh, uh, presenters every year. Um, so there's a there's an application process. It's fairly straightforward. That's and, how someone would get involved in that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And if they were going to come and listen to you uh, speak, it would be on Thursday. What what's the dates? Uh, Origins is January nineteenth through the twenty third. I'm sorry, June. 19th. I was going to say, it'd be <laughs> wild. Right, that's a long way out. <laughs> Got a lot of prep. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> no problem. Um, and no there's there's going to be a link uh, on my on my socials. It's kind of hard to find. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to find that link for everybody and make it really easy. Yeah. But not on the website. <laughs> yeah, it'll be on the website. website. <laughs> I'll put a, I'll put a banner at the bottom, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so a couple things. One. Are you interested in a PDF of the Dreadlord book? Yeah, I'd love that. Okay, I mean, I know, I'm sure you have a folder full of PDFs of games you've never even looked at. <laughs> no. 
Because uh, I, I know how this is. Yeah, acquiring tabletop games is a very different hobby from playing tabletop games. Uh, absolutely. Um, here's a question. Do you do reviews for books? Do you have time to do that? Uh, I uh, I do not. Um, the, the approach that I take, uh, you know, the, the approach that I took with making a monster was um, I need to... Uh, what makes the show what it is is having a monster with an interesting story and an interesting connection to the world uh, mm. and the person who designed it. Um, but I haven't been taking new guests in a while because, again, I... I yeah, sure. The, you the haven't done that that, that podcast. I mean, in general, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking oh, yeah. for a friend. What? No. <laughs> like, I, uh, I get it. And I, I, um, I don't have an audience who expects me to review games at this point. Um, so even how, if I said yes, I, I don't know how that would help anyone. The again, I'm 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 digging on the podcast. I know that that's that's a project that's that's it's there, but it's kind of on standstill while you do these other things. Um, but I'm interested in it. it's what I prepped for. So goddamn it. Thanks. Uh, when someone tells you about a monster, do they take you through? I guess two questions. Do they take you through the process of the creation, or are they just telling you about it? And then my second question, a lot of these podcast episodes start with a what sounds like a narration from a module or perhaps a game session. Uh, explain. <laughs> I didn't expect okay. that to happen. Um, that was a happy accident. Mm. Uh, I did it for my first couple episodes and actually uh, I recorded the first couple episodes in a batch. One of my guests had the foresight to uh, read some of the, the flavor text or the read aloud box from the game. Mm. Um, and it just really worked for the format, uh, having mm. like a, a minute or two up front where you kind of kind of encountered the monster the way you would at a table, uh, made it really mm. natural for people. Uh, and it was a, a great way. It was a way that everyone... Uh, most of my guests, if you're a game designer, then you have, then you're a game master at some point, like you know how to run right. a game and you know how to do good narration and draw a table into the kind of experience that you're, uh, that you're giving them, whatever that, that happens to be. So, uh, that just became a really easy way to, um, to start the show. Uh, it made people, um, usually record that in about the middle by the time people are comfortable and kind of loosened up and excited about the mm -hmm. thing they're talking about. Uh, and it, uh, it worked out really well. Yeah. And then what was my first question? Oh, uh, how do how do people um what do, do people Oh yeah, do they show you the actual creation process or sometimes um, It's usually D&D, &D, right? Usually, or D20 but, stuff. Okay. Uh, usually, but that's only because I think uh, I like to think that the the backlog of the podcast accurately reflects the percentage of D&D's market share. Uh, like most of the time, <laughs> all. <laughs> yeah. If you ask someone whether they play a TTRPG, most of the time it's it's D and D. But I've, mm, I've advocated pretty hard over the course of the show for games that aren't Dungeons and Dragons because I don't want to perpetuate a, a stranglehold on storytelling, especially in that oral tradition. Um, there are other games out there, and some of them are really good at stuff that D and D is not good at, and I want people to yeah, like. Oh, like Dreadlore. Like, I want people to... <laughs> no, like everything. Yeah, I want people to be able to find the game that works for them. Um, and I, I've had really great conversations with people who design outside of D&D's accepted vocabulary and, and, and strictures. So sometimes they'll show me how they put it together. A lot of times I have to kind of work to get that out of them. <clears throat> um, but when people really grok the, what the show is, they, they come prepped with, like, Here is, here's what I made here's mm. how it was a logical step forward from my, yeah. my influences and here's a couple of things that i brought into it with me either from the monster itself or from my own work and that i think is what yeah. makes a, what makes an interesting episode um cause yeah they there there were all they were all uh interesting the ones that i listened to thanks man yeah i thought they were actually they were they're very very well done um i don't want to lump you in i'm going to though i'm gonna lump you in by it by just what i'm about to say okay uh i watch so this is not a political statement but i'm going to say something political uh did you listen to rachel maddow maddow's uh ultra i did not 
it's interesting. I mean, uh, it, it a lot of people won't dig it, but Rachel Maddow, like, whether you agree with her or not, the format of this very, very successful podcast, your podcast reminded me of. <laughs> well, great. Uh, uh, we'll it's 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 it's, it's very, it's really it's really interesting. I was I was very uh, impressed. Yeah, I have to check it out. Uh, but yeah, I'm jealous. No. <laughs> uh, the the YouTube er that I was talking about prior, uh, yeah. Professor Dungeon Master, his his channel's Dungeon Craft, specifically Dungeon Craft, the number one, and he ta talks about D and D a lot. One of the things that he mentions is um, essentially clickbait. So it's a YouTube thing, right? Um, people saying things like, for example, D and D Doom. That kind of stuff. Or I quit D&D, &D, that kind of stuff. And he has this whole uh, apologetic about clickbait and specifically about talking or all, always having topics surrounding D&D &D and D20. And essentially it is this. Um, it's what people click on. So if you if you have an episode or a title that says something like, hey, look, here's this new system. Um, you know, there it's, it's, it's all cool and all these things. It's D six. No one clicks on it. But if you say something like, Oh, check out this, you know, Bram Stoker's Dracula setting D D everyone clicks on it. And that's a deal. You know I mean? Like people want to hear about D and D it's dungeons and dragons. It's cool. It's a cool name. Cool fucking logo. Um, and for some reason, people think it's easy uh, to learn. How long did it take you to learn D&D? &D? How long did it take me to... You learn? played in 2015, you said? Yeah. Which part? Uh, which part? Uh, playing, writing? Yeah, well, or here's running? a better question. Here's a better question. Uh, and of course, it's facetious, see seeping with facetiousness. Um, you know, how long did it take you to read the, you know... The PHB, the Player's Handbook. I'm not sure I've read it top to bottom. No, oh, how, how long did it take you to, to read the Dungeon Master's Guide? You know that book that explains how to run the game? Oh, that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, I've read... You didn't read it, did you? chunks of it, but just, like, the parts that I needed. Think um, about that for a second. I feel really, I feel really deeply in love with the uh, planar cosmology part. Of oh, dude, it's the, the best part. It's it's yeah. the best part. Planescape is hands down, in my opinion, the best part of D and D. I believe Monty Cook uh, was a big uh, opponent of it. I may be wrong on that. I think it's Monty Cook. Maybe Tracy Hickman. Mm, not sure. Planescape's awesome. What I'm trying to say is, how'd you learn it if you didn't read the book? Because I I can't name a board game that you you don't have to read the book to learn. Oh yeah. Uh we we learned it together by trial and error with uh, a small committed group of friends that i already trusted to make mistakes uh, and be emotionally vulnerable with um mm, sure so and i think that's uh what i've noticed talking to a lot of people about ttrpgs is that the first time you play will set the tone for whether or not you enjoy this hobby at all going forward 100 percent, 100 if you end up at a bad table for the first time uh, you're done. A bad table for you, then you're gonna assume that this is not you, uh, and maybe that's fine. Maybe it is. Uh, it's a shame. Uh, Giving it a chance is good. I my first foray was I was 12. They pulled me in from oh, yeah. rollerblading, and uh, <clears throat> and they were like, "We're gonna play D and D," and I was like, "Okay," because they're in Kentucky, so they're like, "Ding dong, ding dong, ding." They were playing some D and D, uh, and that was funny. And they were like, we're going to make characters. So I didn't know how to make a character. I didn't know what that meant. So I drew my character, thinking that was making a character. Right, yeah. I had no idea what dice were. And Mortal Kombat 2 had come out. So my character had like Baraka arms, you know, the big blades and shit. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I was an elf girl because I was a 12-year-old boy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think I've told this story on stream. But the long and the short of it is, <clears throat> it takes us like a couple hours to make. They're all into it. Everyone, of course, is an elf, and they're like, cool, here's the lead-in, 
uh, all of the male elves have gone off into the forest to hunt, which immediately I was like thinking of Tolkien. So I was like, wait, why the fuck are we in the forest hunting? Aren't we like civilized? I mean, elves live in the forest, sure, but we're going to go hunt? What? Seems a little weird, like wearing pelts and shit. All the male elves go off and hunt. And while that happens, the orcs come and uh, rape and pillage the village. Yeah. They rape the horses and roll up on the women. This is a Three Amigos joke. Uh, and I'm like, yo, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a girl elf. And they were like, oh, <laughs> you get raped and, you know, thrown over the shoulder and enslaved. And I was like, and I'm out. Yep. And that was my first foray. Now, good, bad, ugly, whatever. I was like, you guys suck. Go play magic, you losers. And I didn't play again until uh, I had a college degree. And it was awesome. <laughs> but it took it took like 12 years, you know, to come yeah. back to it. So the whole point of me saying that is uh, I, I think I think you're right. What got you into it? I mean, what what got you to give it a chance? Was it a group of people that were already playing, or what was the deal? It was just really persistent friends. And actually, um, 2015, I think, was when uh, the Acquisitions Inc. podcast started. Um, mm, I don't know. Uh, that's uh, it. Was one of the first actual play podcasts. Oh wow! I did not know yeah. that. And then uh, Critical Role started shortly after. So mm -hmm. I, I, ha I was given a model of the game played well. Uh, and that I kind see. of broke the ice a bit. Um, oh, okay. I see. Yeah. I see. And then I had some friends who were like, no, we really think we can get <clears> you a shot. We think you'd enjoy it. We're going to find some PDFs somewhere and, and get you some dice. And uh, those, those two things together were what made it happen. So how long did it take you to learn it? Uh, to learn how to play? To learn how to play or to learn how to play well uh because i made just to play lot, just to play um i made a lot of mistakes in my first campaign and i didn't really know that they were mistakes until we were done uh, Holker and drizzle have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> um yeah it's hard honestly at this point it's hard to remember man that was like nine years ago uh you should have live streamed it <laughs> it would be immortalized on YouTube, oh. like some other <laughs> other campaigns. <laughs> Don't think I have the resilience for that. Uh... <laughs> Neither do we. It's uh, well, what I'm trying to I say mean, is, do you, go on, go on. Trisha, from, please, from the sounds of me. it, from the sounds of it, you got into D and D just like I did. You were badgered to your friends till you played. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I was interested already, but like, what, you know, they 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 sold me on it. Um, I knew I wasn't going it alone, and I knew I wasn't like, uh, on the hook for, for something I wasn't, uh, for something I wasn't comfortable with, you know. So, so here's a question: Would if if those group, if that group of friends, or perhaps someone you don't even know, were like, hey, why don't you? play another game you want to try out another game how much and this is an honest question because i feel it as well and maybe you don't how much resistance is there to oh man i gotta learn something completely new uh almost none but then i'm an exceptional case um partly because i already know and love so many other systems uh, partly because i do this for a job and like i kind of understand how a ttrpg is put together Okay. Uh, oh, then we lost them. Oh, am I gone? No, you're, no back. you're there. I'm back. You just uh, froze a bit. Yeah. Was that like this? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Everything sucks. <laughs> so, yeah, I understand how a TTRPG is put together. I can, I can fairly easily kind of parse things out. Um, I have a backlog of games that I would love to play with people that I just know is never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel that. Well, I'll send you the Dreadlore uh, PDF or a link to it. Thanks. Um, if you want to take a gander at it or whatever, uh, we do uh, one-shots um, here and there. We usually do it on Mondays, but we can do it in other times too. 
and I'm trying to get a um, a group of people that would like to learn. Uh, maybe like a couple people and then a couple veteran players. So if you're ever interested, then you are welcome to, uh, to try it out. Um, okay, I know you got to leave soon. Holker, any questions for Lugath? Is the Leviathan in your book? The 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 what? The Leviathan. Holker. Leviathan. I'm gonna punch you in the face. Which which Leviathan? It's it's uh it's the name of a an actual extinct uh toothed whale that might have been the thing that ate the megalodon. Uh no. Um I don't Yeah, know. it's it's like a it's it's like a a, a sperm whale and a demon and and they they yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh But it was, it was a real it was a real creature. Oh, I believe you. Um, it's just when, when you say Leviathan, there's like there's a biblical reference for that. There's yeah, I think that they when they named it, it was they, it was kind of a play on that word, but it was an absolutely real creature, and it it probably ate whales and sharks and whatnot. Uh, oh yeah, damn. Well, um, you showed Hulk. Uh, you showed Hulker up on the first two. He's just trying not to even the score. He's, just, he's <laughs> further into deep time. He's coming after you, man. He's coming after you. <laughs> <laughs> uh Drizzle, do you have any questions for Lucas? I do not. Uh the only thing would be, and you'll probably say, is there anything else you wanted to talk about that we haven't already? Anything of yours to promote or anything that we haven't talked about? Um, yeah, I mean I, I would love for people to check out a game called Precious Things. Uh it was the first thing I put out on itch.io. It's a it's a one page RPG about tiny dragons building a cozy horde in the modern day world. And it's also a promissory note for a much larger uh, role playing game that is to come later this year from Wedding Games. Uh, so yeah, Trent, I'm, uh, I wanted to make a game for people who don't necessarily have a good first experience with tabletop role playing games. Um, so I made one that was easy, fun and accessible and had kind of a cool thing to say about um, uh, dragons, the quintessential monster, and what happens when they get smaller and have to deal with uh, the pressures of a modern industrialized society. Um, so you can find that on my website, uh, scintilla.studio, and I'm going to be making some noise about it uh, on the internet as we get into the next couple of weeks. That's awesome. Uh, is it D20 based? It's not. Uh, it is. Uh, so Wedding Games has a system of their own called Plus One. It relies on a few mm. D6 and a deck of cards. Uh, which yeah, is okay. interesting math and a, a different way yeah. of putting things together. Yeah, yeah, those those games are really neat. I like I like the one page modules. Um, <clears throat> my buddy uh, Jeff McNeil, who's a, a game designer as well, uh, put me onto OSR and a lot of the the one page worlds, and you kind of don't know what to do with them, <laughs> but uh, it's almost like they're just inspiring in and of themselves. Yeah, and it's what I based my modules on as well. Not a lot of space for, uh, for really strong rule sets or a lot of yeah. help for people. So you just kind of give people one page that they can print out, and it's like forty-five to sixty minutes of a good time. Uh, yeah, I, I think they're very fun. I think if you if you want to become a game designer or if you have a game idea, uh, and it uh, and you want to check it out, write it as a one-page RPG first. Um, if it works yeah, that way then you can build it out bigger and it'll still work. Now, how do you, a, a lot of people, um, this is a question I had before. A lot of people will have a setting or a splat, um, an adventure, whatever. And it works on D20 because you don't have to explain the rules. Everybody knows the rules. Um, but what if you have a module that doesn't, um, like, for example, it could be something that you could use with whatever, right? As in, like, it's just the setting, and it's agnostic of... Uh, I should slap myself for saying agnostic. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't matter what setting you use. I'm sorry, it doesn't matter what, what rule set you use. How do you explain that in a one-page document? Or do you just say you can use anything you want? Or you need this rule set to... Like, how, how do you attack that? Uh, as far as one pages go, there's like a family of 
proven systems for one pages already. Uh, and if it doesn't, if you can't handle it in a paragraph or two, then you haven't made a one page game, you've made something else, which again is fine, but uh, uh, it's not that not that particular test of game design. Precious Things runs off of, uh, is, a, is a hack of something called Lasers and Feelings. Um, mm. There's one D6 and a couple of numbers, so it's really, it takes about three minutes to explain. Uh, and there's, you know, Ooh, that's rules light, I would assume. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And there are a few other ways to do it. And again, people with a, if you're offering a one page RPG, people kind of have to buy into that. We're going to really make it. a lot of this up as we go uh, experience. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, and I, I, for me, if it's going to be a game, I would love there to be mechanics and lore so that they can rhyme and tell me how this game is to be played. Uh, and to be felt and to be handled uh, from a mechanical standpoint. Is it a faux pas to, for example, with your uh, perfect thing? Is it perfect things or pre precious things? Precious things. Precious things. My bad. I wrote it down wrong. Precious things. Uh, with precious things, is that a deal where in that one paragraph you wrote all the mechanics? Or could you have been like, hey, if you want the mechanics for this, here's a supplementary book or whatever that's like 10 pages or 20 if you want to like get into it or is that like a faux pas of like ah oh, you're broken the one page game uh maybe i i don't know if faux pas is the right word um i wouldn't have done that as a designer because i wanted i wanted it to be i wouldn't want to it seems inhospitable to me to, to promise someone one page that works as a game for, I don't know, 90 minutes or so, and then make them go somewhere else to make the game function. Um, but a Precious Things suggested a lot of themes and mechanical ideas that just were, there was no way they were going to fit on one page. Um, and when I found a, a publisher for that game as well, it um, Precious Things might be unique in that it has a larger, like a full scale source book coming. Mm. But they're they're going to be very different experiences. Um, you know, the, the full source book from Wet Ink is going to be the kind of thing that you can play for maybe a year. Like a campaign. Yeah, yeah like a full campaign. And it's going <clears> to <throat> support that with the mechanics that are necessary. Um, and so it's like a page, teaser. Is yeah, what it is. but you know, and one pages are weird in that they are still a functioning complete game on their own. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And you can interact with the one without interacting with the other, and you'll still have a great time. I think uh, it's just mm. you know what you've got time for and what you what uh, what interests you. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So precious, precious things. That looks really cool. Thanks. And itch.io, I had never heard of. Itch is a Many... fascinating, uh, fascinating platform. Um, if you if you're gonna go if you're gonna like form a company and make a game i recommend building your own website and your own e-commerce platform if you can but if you're not uh places like itch.io itch.io are a great place to kind of um it's it's a lot like etsy for games in that it uh or or the dm drive through. drive through rpg in that they you know they handle the platform and the fulfillment and the uh, payment processing for you uh so you can you know, you can do a lot of experimenting that you wouldn't be able to do if you had to put up all that capital in terms of time or money yourself. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last thing. Let's see. Uh, uh. Holy shit. I think I got through everything. I think I got everything. All right. Anecdote. What's your favorite constellation? Orion. Uh, Orion's my favorite one constellation. Too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's a winter constellation. Is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it's got. Why do you like Orion? You know, just the belt or the whole thing? It, uh, it was easy to spot. Um, mm. And I, you know, I come from uh, coming from northern Illinois and like the rural part of it. I was raised on land that was. Uh, prairie less than a hundred years less than 200 yeah. years before i came along um it's the closest thing you can get to big sky east of yeah. montana um mm. and orion just burned uh if it's a winter constellation that makes a lot of sense because it is long winters and uh the scar the stars always looked brighter and closer uh the goddamn i have a song about that 
<laughs> Corroboration, motherfuckers. Um, Orion has Beetlejuice, or as Holker likes to say, Beetlejuice. Yeah. Uh, I want to say it's 400 ish light years away. Super red giant, or just a red giant? Uh, its exact distance has always been uh, a mystery, but I, the last time I, I think the last value that I heard was around 600 to 700 mm -hmm. light years away. Apparently, when it explodes. <laughs> apparently, when it explodes, if it has already or not, it will be pretty glorious. Pretty glorious. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Fuck yeah, man. Orion is. I talked to Orion. Lucas Zellers, thank you so much for joining us, man. Well, thank Sorry it's been a shit show. <laughs> it's, it's just been all over the place. We, every single other GGP has been so much on point, uh, more on point technology-wise. Uh, normally we have Couchfire Media doing our media production, and today we don't. We got Bill fucking Bumpkin doing it. <laughs> um, I want to say thanks to the Patreon people. Uh, nostalgic, uh, aka Ember Alaria, Natalia Klein, um, Tim Roberts, and Mr. Daniel Holker hooking up that Patreon. Uh, for our music, it's normally all lowercase letters, but not tonight. Tonight it was Intrepid Adventurers. Uh, and I think that's pretty much it. We'll be back, I think, next Thursday. What is next Thursday? Is the what's the date? Is like the, the second or something? The second. Second. It's like, yeah, we're back next Thursday with somebody. Check it out. Uh, Lucas Zellers, thank you so much, man, My for pleasure, joining guys. us. No, uh, it you. sounds like you have tons going on, and we want to be a part of it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm hoping, I'm hoping things will calm down. Uh, and I'm, I'm, yeah, it's a great time to be me. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm glad that there are people out there who take the time to encounter my work and you know ask great questions about it i'm always floored when i meet people who enjoy it um and that's why i i keep doing what i do is uh to, to try and get people into that place yeah absolutely and when book of extinctions comes out uh and when this precious things come out and when the actual source book for precious things comes out uh do let me know uh through email or discord or whatever i'm gonna send you the pdf for dreadlore and you are welcome to play if you want thank you you've got time bye everybody good night bye bye